My name is Diego Melgar from the uh, University of Oregon, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you might be, and welcome to our meeting of the Committee on Solid Earth Geophysics on Time-Dependent Earthquake Hazard. If I can scroll forward. I'm going to give a few introductory remarks about the, our committee and its mission, and then about the subject and, and our speakers for today. Um, our committee is part of the National Academies of Science. And uh, the mission for the NAS is as the nation's preeminent source of expert evidence-based and objective advice on science, engineering, and, and health matters. And the NAS informs policy with evidence, sparks progress and innovation, and confronts challenging issues for the benefit of society. The NAS, uh, importantly, serves as a neutral convening body to provide guidance on program direction and priorities, help resolve scientific or uh, science policy controversies, and also provide technical ana analyses and independent peer review. It informs solid, uh, sorry, it informs science policy debates, and it builds and maintains uh, scientific networks while also summarizing state of the science uh, to audiences of varying technical knowledge, while increasing the ability, uh, the visibility of emerging scientific fields and policy issues. Uh, we are the Committee on Solid Earth Geophysics, or COSEG, and we support the community discussion and community agency uh, interactions, and we encourage understanding, review, and exchange regarding Earth structure, dynamics, and evolution. The committee fosters long-term efforts to collect, store, and disseminate related uh, data and to monitor geodynamical events and nuclear testing treaties. All of our meeting resources, reports, and webinars are available uh, online. Our membership and staff uh, is listed here. Torsten Becker from UT Austin is COSEG chair. Mark Bain from Boston College. Jeff Freimuller from Michigan State University. Rangan Gok from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Myself from the University of Oregon. Steve Nareem from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Donna Shillington from Northern Arizona University and Jessica Warren uh, from the University of Delaware. Our staff uh, member is uh, Deb Glickson, whose name should probably be in an even bigger font than all of us, given her outsized uh, importance. Our sponsors are the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, the National Science Foundation, NSF, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy, DOE, and the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, USGS. We uh, meet frequently throughout the year on a wide variety of topics. Our most recent meeting uh, was about how plates are made and preserved. Prior to that, we discussed novel, geoph novel geophysical data sets for environmental uh, applications, uh, solid earth science and sea level change, and tracking environmental changes due to COVID through remote sensing. And we also met about enhancing quantitative capacities for geoscience programs and on Beyond the Black Box, the future of machine learning and data intensive applications for solid earth uh, geosciences. Now I'd like to uh, talk briefly about our motivation uh, for today's meeting before I turn it over uh, to our experts who are gonna lead us uh, through the discussion. This uh, very basic equation outlined here can in a way be thought to encode the relationship between earthquakes uh, and society and it says that the risk or the exposure to harm, danger, and loss that we're susceptible to is the combination of the hazard that we're gonna focus on today. And that can be understood as uh, pretty basically how frequently shaking or tsunamis, the hazardous phenomena, occur. But that needs to be um, measured against the exposure, which is a measure of the people or the assets in the impacted area and the vulnerability, which is the propensity for loss of life or damage uh, to those assets. Perhaps an, an example helps to illustrate uh, what we're talking about here. Um, the Haiti earthquake in 2010 illuminates this. The hazard in the region around Port-au-Prince, uh, shown here in this figure, I've sort of conceptually quantified as medium, because even though it's right next to the Enriquillo plantain fault, the slip rates on that fault are relatively moderate, about seven millimeters per year. So not as fat, not nearly as fast as other systems. But the exposure is quite high with uh, Port-au-Prince being a very densely uh, populated uh, city. And more importantly, the vulnerability is extremely high. As you can see from uh, some of these pictures, a lot of masonry structures 
which we know through concepts like fragility curves uh, that are shown here, are extremely susceptible to collapse even with moderate levels of shaking. As a result of that, the risk itself is very high or was very high, and the losses were very high during that event um, because of these other two val variables, the exposure and the vulnerability, even if the hazard itself m might not have been perceived um, as high. So tragic as that event was, 200,000 lives uh, were lost. It was not altogether unexpected. Here today, we're going to focus on one part of this equation, which is uh, the hazard. And I want to talk a little bit about that um, by introducing first uh, one of the common data products that are produced when people talk about hazard. Shown here is the 2018, uh, the latest, USGS National Seismic Hazard Map. The colors encode the perceived likelihood of shaking, of damaging shaking in the next 100 years, with red being very high, uh, yellow a little less so, and blue being low. These hazard maps are difficult to build, and they require a mathematical formalism, in this case a probabilistic framework, to put together. And they symbolize a scientific synthesis of what is known for a region. In order to make these, we need to know where the faults are. We need to know their slip rates so that we know the rates of expected occurrence of earthquakes. We need to know about wave propagation phenomena or the waves being ducted through a slab or through a fault damage zone. Uh, for example, and we need to know about side effects that might amplify or attenuate uh, the damaging shaking, such as basins or topographic effects. It's a very big effort to put a map uh, like this one together, and because of it, and because of its significant uncertainties, one common simplifying assumption is to make the calculation time independent, in essence to say that the hazard does not change uh, with time. Now, of course, uh, the relationship between earthquakes and society, not just the hazard we know, must change through time. The hazard's going to change through time. The exposure is going to change through time as cities uh, are built out. And the vulnerability is going to change through time as building codes change. Here today, we're going to talk specifically about how to make hazard calculations time dependent. And there's many reasons why we would expect that seismic hazard uh, would change with time. One of them is simply tectonics. Uh, century to millennia scale processes affect uh, where earthquakes are likely. And shown here in this figure is simply uh, how long has it been for a particular fault since its most recent earthquake. And the interpretation is that the longest, that uh, the longer times that have elapsed since the previous damaging earthquake mean that that fault is perhaps closer to failure and should then be considered more hazardous. Another reason why hazard necessarily changes can be because of shorter ter term stress changes. Um, shown here is a map of the likelihood of magnitude 3.5 and larger events following the Ridgecrest 2019 magnitude 7.1 main shock. We would expect that the occurrence of that earthquake loads or unloads uh, neighboring faults and means that the likelihood of uh, other events should change as a result of that earthquake. There's also human influence. We know very well that fracking and particularly wastewater injection can change the rates of seismicity in certain regions. Uh, shown here is, for example, the one-year probability of damaging shaking, especially for the state of Oklahoma, which is far away from a plate boundary, but whose hazard is perceived to be much higher for that particular year, uh, given human interaction with a critically stressed crust. So that's what we're going to talk about Today, how can new scientific advances help to understand the nature of this time dependence? And what are the mathematical formalisms that we can use um, to quantify it? It's a very thorny question, and to try to address it, we've convened a series of experts. Uh, today's meeting will be conducted in two separate sessions. Here's the schedule uh, for our first uh, session. We will have a short panel discussion at the end of the session with our speakers, and then we will take a short break. Following that, we will have a second session where we will look more closely at losses and impacts and connections to risk. And in the same way, we will have a panel discussion with session two speakers at the end, which will be followed by a longer panel discussion session with speakers from both sessions one and sessions two. For online attendees, I'll remind you that you can ask questions through the Q&A feature of the webinar, so navigate to the Q&A button 
at the bottom right of your screen, and you can type in your question there, and the moderators of each session um, will pose the questions uh, to the speakers. So with uh, that in mind, I'd like to introduce um, our first uh, set of speakers. I'm going to introduce, sorry, I'm looking here through my notes, uh, Drs. Marco uh, Pagani and Richard Styron from the Global Earthquake Model Foundation. Marco Pagani is the coordinator of the Seismic Hazard Team at GEM. He has more than 20 years of experience in probabilistic seismic hazard analysis and seismic microzonation. Dr. Richard Theron is an active fault specialist for GEM, and he runs the uh, Earth Analysis, a research and consulting firm. His research mostly specializes on faulting, stress, and lithospheric uh, deformation. Marco? Actually, I will be uh, uh, giving the talk, so. Um, okay, let me share my screen here. Okay, can everyone see this? Okay, great. Um, so hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Richard Styron and I'm a hazard scientist with the Global Earthquake Model Foundation or the GEM Foundation. Uh, today I'm going to provide an overview of both the different phenomena and the different modeling approaches involved in time-dependent seismic hazard modeling. First I'll introduce seismic hazard modeling. So seismic hazard analysis is a quantitative method to compute the, the values of ground shaking expected at some site during a given time interval or from a given event. At regional scales and larger, where a broad range of earthquakes must be considered, the state of practice is to use probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, or PSHA. PSHA calculates the probability of exceeding some intensity of ground shaking in a given time interval. It integrates over all potential sources of engineering concern and incorporates uncertainties and parameters as well as the randomness or natural variation in the rate of earthquake production from those seismic sources. So there are two components to a PSHA model. The first is the seismic source characterization, which defines the locations, the geometries, the rates and magnitudes of all potential earthquakes in the study area. There are a variety of source types that are used from very general spatial polygons or grids that produce distributed seismicity um, to specific faults, uh, to more complex sources that may represent subduction zone megathrusts or subducting slabs. The second component is the ground motion characterization, which defines how the seismic energy released by each earthquake propagates and attenuates before reaching the sites where we compute the hazard. Because the impacts of time dependence on ground motion attenuation are minor, we're going to concern ourselves primarily with the source characterization component. However, one thing to note here that was not intuitive to a fault geologist like myself but it's probably more obvious to engineers and seismologists, is that hazard calculations are all performed at a site or a collection of sites that are geographical locations where someone may wanna build a building or whatever, accounting for seismic sources within tens or hundreds of kilometers. The calculations are not typically performed for individual faults or earthquakes without much regard for where the ground shaking would be felt or measured. The ground motion component has to be included in the hazard calculations. So here's a picture of the hazard curve, which is the fundamental result of a PSHA at a single site. The intensity of ground shaking, for example, the peak ground acceleration is on the x-axis and on the y-axis is the rate or roughly the probability of ground motion intensity. And the reciprocal of the exceedance rates on the y-axis are called the return periods, which is roughly analogous to a hundred or a thousand year flood. So hazard curves always show these monotonic decreases in probability with increasing levels of ground shaking, demonstrating that stronger ground shaking is less frequent than weaker ground shaking. Stronger ground shaking can be either from larger earthquakes or from closer earthquakes. So one other important thing to note is that different user groups are interested in different return periods in order to properly manage their risk. Uh, typical buildings will only stand for a few decades and can't take huge engineering costs. So they're designed around fairly frequent lower magnitudes of ground shaking. Larger important community buildings such as hospitals, schools, and other civic infrastructure should withstand greater shaking, dealing with stronger or closer events with thousands of year return periods, while very critical facilities such as power plants may need to be engineered for more rare, even stronger events. So there are three broad classes of, uh, of 
the phenomena of earthquake occurrence and, and time dependence. So um, the first one that we'll talk about is what's called quasi-periodic recurrence of large earthquakes on a single source, typically a single uh, well-known fault. Um, the second are aftershocks and foreshocks, uh, which are very familiar concepts, even if they can be quite tricky to define precisely. And the third class um, is uh, either clustered or triggered main shocks on nearby fault sources. So from a geophysical perspective, uh, these phenomena are likely linked, but we don't fully understand all the science here yet. Major earthquakes um, uh, often occur on faults um, and are somewhat regularly spaced in time. So particularly for large plate boundary faults um, and uh, uh, most well-known are the big plate boundary strike slip faults such as the San Andreas or the Alpine fault in New Zealand. And on these uh, faults, we see a fairly regular occurrence of, of major earthquakes that are relatively close in the same magnitude. So the um, plot on the upper right has um, the Alpine fault on top and um, we can see earthquake occurrence in diamonds through time. And we can see that this thing ruptures almost like clockwork. Um, on other faults such as the San Andreas and the, the Dead Sea transform, there's a little bit more variation in the recurrence intervals, but if you look at it statistically, they're still quasi-periodic. Um, so from that quasi-periodic, um, model, we can look at the rate of earthquake occurrence on that fault with time since the last event. And so that is shown uh, in, the, in the plot on the bottom. And um, time since the last event normalized to the mean recurrence interval is shown on the x-axis. And the rate of earthquake occurrence, given that it has um, uh, not yet occurred, is shown on uh, the y-axis. And so um, the most important thing is we can see that following a major event, the likelihood of earthquake occurrence drops pretty much zero and then starts climbing um, up until you get to about the mean recurrence. Um, after that, what happens uh, is, is really dependent on the statistical model used. Um, and there's, there's a lot of variation and um, that does affect the hazard pretty dramatically. Uh, but we don't really have good ways of identifying this within the kind of limited paleo seismic um, data sets that we have. So something important about, about quasi-periodic earthquakes is that they're tied to a, um, what we call characteristic earthquakes or characteristic faults, where a single fault or fault segment will rupture um, uh, in these large events of relatively consistent magnitude that releases all of the accumulated stress or strain on the fault. And um, then there must be some period of tectonic reloading in order for the fault to rupture again. Uh, in order for this to be um, something that we can use in modeling, um, it means that, that these faults must have persistent segmentation. So, so ruptures on these faults must be relatively contained within each um, fault segment and those segments um, act somewhat independently. So, and, and let me say that that's, that's somewhat contentious behavior. So, um, so next we can move on to aftershocks. These are the most well-observed time-dependent uh, earthquake behavior. So aftershock rates decrease in the minutes to the decades following a main shock. Um, this is usually described with what we call Omori's law. And um, furthermore, aftershock magnitudes tend to be smaller than the main shock magnitude um, in general, the largest aftershock is, is about an order of magnitude smaller than the main shock, although there's variation here too. Um, because the magnitudes of aftershocks tend to be so much smaller than the main shock and are so close to it, aftershocks are often ignored in long-term PSHA, um, but can be treated in, in um, short-term PSHA following large events. Finally, the last phenomenon that I think is the most poorly understood is um, uh, clustered main shocks. And so here we have nearby faults that, rel that rupture relatively close in time um, with respect to the mean inter-event times of these earthquakes. And these are well described in instrumental and paleo seismic catalogs. Um, statistically, they're unlikely to be random and they're probably evidence of earthquakes triggering each other through stress interaction. Um, but there are multiple uh, physical mechanisms of stress interaction um, that are suspected. And, and importantly, these mechanisms are non-exclusive. So it doesn't really mean one or the other, 
So a proper model must account for all of them in their proper balance. So now we're gonna talk about the, the different modeling strategies involved um, in, in large scale PSHA. So one thing I wanna note first is that the approaches are mostly at the research level. They're not um, common components of, of national scale uh, seismic hazard analysis yet. So my employer, the GEM Foundation, is a nonprofit that collects and produces seismic hazard models worldwide. And we have a global hazard mosaic that represents the state of the art regional to national scale models produced by the top institutions, uh, public institutions globally. So of the 31 models making up the global hazard mosaic, only two that are um, uh, have time dependent components. And this is um, Japan and then the conterminous US. There's a third major model um, the USERF 3 time dependent model for California made by the US Geological Survey um, that we have not implemented the time dependent, independent, excuse me, we have not implemented the time dependent version, we have implemented the time independent version within the gem mosaic, although this will likely change in the future. So um, within the types of time dependent PSHA that we see, there's multiple modeling strategies for different phenomena. Uh, the first is aftershock PSHA. Then we can deal with some clustered main shocks um, uh, as well as periodic uh, earthquakes on characteristic sources. And then finally, there's evolutionary or interactive models um, that describe how faults and earthquakes interact with each other and how the system evolves with time. So aftershock PSHA um, is, uh, typically done conditional on the occurrence of an earthquake main shock. Um, immediately following an earthquake, this is op often called operational earthquake forecasting. And so um, we see elevated le uh, levels of seismic hazard in the, in the days to decades after the event. And um, this hazard decreases with time uh, commensurate with a more um, decay of, of, of earthquake rates. And eventually it, it settles down to the mean rate. Um, so there is some statistical methods in development um, to incorporate these into national scale uh, PSHA. So um, for example, there's the epidemic type aftershock sequences that uh, Morgan Page, who's the next speaker, as well as others have been developing for the, um, for the US. Uh, uh, GEM also has some experimental efforts in incorporating this into classical PSHA, but I'm not gonna talk in detail about that. So the next time dependent model is um, what are called cluster models. And this is where we have groups of several earthquakes that are going to ha happen in quick succession um, that are relatively uh, closely spaced in time. And they operate as kind of a clump that can happen anytime in a time dependent framework, but all of the individual earthquakes within it will, will occur um, in that clump. And um, so this is implemented in the, uh, for the New Madrid, uh, earthquakes in um, the central Mississippi River Valley um, following the 1811-1812 events. And um, uh, there's also room for adding pretty complex behavior uh, for earthquake clustering um, uh, that it can include mutually exclusive rupture combinations. For example, you can have a subduction zone that can uh, rupture in either one magnitude nine event or multiple closely spaced magnitude eight events, but not both uh, within that time dependent framework. So cluster models are interesting compared to time independent hazard. Um, the ground motion varies um, between uh, the sort of end member models at different return periods. So um, uh, this is a plot from, from Boyd 2012 and uh, the red curve represents the um, the three models from New Madrid, if they're, uh, excuse me, the three earthquakes uh, in New Madrid, if they're treated independently. And uh, the black curve represents um, one single uh, event from that cluster. Then the blue curve represents the cluster model. So um, at, at higher frequencies of exceedance or um, lower ground motions, the clustered model, um, is very similar to, um, to one single event. So the likelihood of ground shaking from those is, is, is uh, not different from all of the events compared to one event. But as you get to less frequent events um, and stronger ground shaking, uh, 
the cluster starts to become asymptotic towards considering all of the events independently. So this just highlights different use cases uh, um, are going to see different effects at time dependence from the same set of sources this, and the same model. The Japan model has implemented um, time dependent characteristic ruptures uh, for much of its uh, seismic sources. So there are 233 uh, faults in, in Japan that are time independent and 123 faults that are time dependent following a Brownian passage time model. Um, and these have characteristic earthquakes. So, so the, the entire fault source ruptures at once in, in large magnitude events. Um, the subduction source is also uh, segmented and there are time dependent, mutually exclusive ruptures for the largest events, but not for the smallest events, the kind of, you know, magnitude fives and sixes to happen, uh, you know, uh, very, very regularly in Japan. So if we look at these characteristic sources, if we look at a single source and the hazard predicted uh, from it, um, using the Brownian passage time model, which is the most common formulation for time independent or time dependent characteristic sources, um, we can compare that to a time independent or Poisson model. So the time independent model is shown here as a dashed black line. And we have um, uh, time de dependent hazard curves shown um, at various times since the last earthquake. So the most recent is, uh, or most recent following the last main shock is shown here in blue. And um, we see that time, um, uh, excuse me, we see that the hazard following the last earthquake is very low. And um, the Poisson model or time independent model greatly overestimates the hazard. But with increasing time since the last event, eventually the hazard that we would expect um, exceeds the time independent model. And, um, and so we're underestimating it by using time dependence or by using time independence. So also these effects are magnified at the lower um, ground shaking intensities or, or the, the higher frequencies of exceedance than they are at the high, uh, uh, ground shaking side of this. However, this, you know, so this is what you get for a single source. There's been some recent research looking at collections of time dependent sources that interact, and that's not what we see. So there's a lot of variation in the expected behavior here. There are also a lot of uh, phenomenological problems with characteristic ruptures as well as modeling problems. So um, modern and paleo seismic observations support that um, there's varying rupture behavior on different segments. So the top plot is from Duras 2016, and it, um, this shows the Wasatch Fault. And when we look at the paleo seismic behavior, we can see that sometimes you have sub-segment rupture behavior, and sometimes you have um, ruptures that, that go from one sub-segment to the next sub-segment crossing a, um, a segment boundary, but don't rupture any in, entire segment. Um, we've also seen plenty of multi-segment ruptures and even multi-fault ruptures, um, such as the Kaikoura earthquake in New Zealand, which is shown here to the south, which had a, a, an enormous array of different faults that all ruptured in the same earthquake. Um, and, and so we know that characteristic ruptures and, and quasi-periodic faults can't be the most accurate um, account of seismicity on crustal faults. Um, there's also modeling issues with this. So if you have a small or moderate magnitude sub-segment earthquake, does this reset the clock um, fully or maybe just partially for that, that um, segment? How do you consider that? Uh, what happens if you have multi-segment ruptures where you have a lot more slip than you would expect during a sub-segment rupture? Should we be using a different variable other than time to track the state of the system? Um, uh, shear stress is, is um, nice from a fault mechanics standpoint, but incredibly difficult to measure. Elastic strain accumulated or potential strain is a bit easier to measure, but, but a bit harder to, rate to uh, relate to fault mechanics. So um, there's a lot of work to be done kind of on this front, figuring out the best approach. If we'll, um, just considering the uh, sub-segment ruptures and floating ruptures, um, where you have a small earthquake that can occur anywhere on a larger fault surface, um, uh, we're basically forced to discretize the fault surface into, into a lot of small units. So therefore we need um, at least one state variable for every one of those segments in order to describe the time uh, dependence of the system. Um, so when you're dealing with a national model that has hundreds or a thousand faults, 
um, and you break them up into a lot of little pieces, you start to really increase the size and computational expense of the model. Finally, if we want to get into earthquake triggering and rupture interaction, um, the model uh, complexity just really starts to explode. So earthquake interaction, rupture interaction mean rupture dependence. So we can no longer treat all of the sources as these independently operating events, um, excuse me, independently operating um, sources and ruptures, um, we have to consider dependence. And so therefore, just in terms of um, the, the basic variables we'd use for representing the rates or the states, we would go from a single basically vector of independent variables for each event um, to a matrix where we have, have more or less squared that and um, to account for all of the interaction. And, um, you know, so if you have a rupture or if you have an earthquake um, model that has a million ruptures, which is, which is pretty common, you know, all of a sudden you can be easily dealing with a million squared terms. So, so that becomes really complex to deal with. And we tend to not just uh, track all of the states at once as different variables. Um, furthermore, the physics and statistics of this interaction is still unknown and it, and it can change over time. It should change over time, even in the absence of continued seismicity. So um, uh, the plot on top shows the, um, the evolution of stresses from viscoelasticity in the uh, North Anatolian fault following the Izmit and Duce earthquakes. So, so even though there's only two earthquakes in here, the system One continues minute. to evolve through time. Okay, thank you. So, because we can't easily integrate over all of these sources in all of the states uh, numerically, we have to use simulation models. So, um, so simulations can account for model evolution, but you know, they're simply sam samples from, from a large distribution of, of uh, possible evolution paths. Um, the epidemic type aftershock sequence is the most commonly used model here and uh, that Morgan will talk about uh, in detail, I assume. So this is a recursive model. So each earthquake produces a sequence of aftershocks and um, those aftershocks, or at least the larger ones, are capable of producing their own aftershocks. And so we have this, uh, you know, potential spread of, um, of seismicity. And I think after the past two years, we all know why we call this an epidemic type uh, model. Um, uh, the rupture interaction and triggering um, within a typical ETAS model are defined statistically, not physically. Um, although the USERF 3 ETAS model for California couples um, ETAS triggering with elastic rebound um, that simulates the, the tectonic um, reaccumulation of tectonic stresses and quasi-periodic behavior for large faults. Physics-based models are also a, you know, a research topic, but they're not widely used in PSHA. Um, they can incorporate physical concepts such as rate and state friction, where, where fault strength varies as a function of time, um, as well as elastic Coulomb stress effects and even viscoelastic and after, um, uh, after slip effects. These are very computationally demanding, especially dealing with uh, viscoelasticity and after slip, where you more or less have to use finite element models representing a huge volume of, of crust and upper mantle instead of simple elastic techniques. Um, and uh, and so, so they really require um, huge resources in order to operate at a large scale. There's lots of different rooms for combinations of, of physics and statistics that, that hit different um, uh, sort of realism to efficiency um, uh, goals here. So to summarize this, there's a broad range of time-dependent earthquake behaviors that we see phenomenologically. We have multiple mo modeling strategies to deal with these different phenomena, but it's, it's uh, I think important to note that the physics is, isn't well incorporated into the models and it's also not fully understood yet. So there's a lot of room for research here. And um, the few examples we've seen, I think indicate that until we have time-dependent PSHA that's widely implemented and vetted against a, um, all the observations we can bear, we may not really understand how um, seismic hazard is impacted by time dependence. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, we're gonna move on uh, to the next talk and we'll circle back during the panel discussion for um, questions. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Morgan Page. She is a research geophysicist at the US Geological Survey where she is interested in 
not surprisingly, probabilistic hazard analysis, and more broadly, inverse problems in seismology with a research focus on statistical um, issues, including rigorously incorporating models and their uncertainties into the hazard analysis, uh, quantifying their uncertainties, as well as kinematic conversions and analyzing non-stationarities in earthquake uh, catalogs. Morgan, please. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. All right, so I'm going to be talking about um, seismic hazard from the perspective of a developer of the USERF model in California. So um, this model, which was alluded to in the previous talk, is, oh, it's not letting me change my slides. Oh, there we go. Um, uses a variety of different data to come up with a composite forecast for California. And this model is currently being expanded to um, cover the entire Western US and will form the um, Western US component of the national seismic hazard maps in the future. So this model combines um, geodetic information geologic information to determine um, the rate at which different faults in California are moving. And also it uses paleo seismic data. So places where we've dug up and say a thousand years of earthquake history in certain spots in California to determine the rates of prehistoric earthquakes. It also uses um, seismicity. So earth where um, recent earthquakes have occurred combined to make a composite forecast that is used to set um, building codes in California and insurance rates. So um, we have an inversion approach that solves for the rate of ruptures on this um, complex fault system that I'm showing here. And I'm not gonna go into the details of the inversion, but the main thing is it takes uh, all the varieties of data I just described and comes up with how often each of the different earthquakes on this fault system occur in a way that's consistent with that data. So it actually comes up with, uh, we have a simulated annealing inversion that comes up with multiple models that can fit the data because it is an underdetermined problem. Um, we have on this fault network, um, about 250,000 possible earthquake ruptures above about magnitude 6.5. Um, that have myriad different ways of linking up different faults and many different magnitudes in um, nucleating in different locations. So this is a huge change from um, the way seismic hazard was done in the past in um, California, just showing a you know, 20 year old model for the Bay Area, showing faults uh, very strictly segmented on the left. By comparison, the USERF model for um, uh, California is shown on the right, just showing on the top panel on the right, just all the different um, faults that can link up with one section of the Hayward Fault in the Bay Area. So it's most likely, of course, to link up with the faults close, but you know, every 100,000 years or so, according to our model, it can link up all the way with the Southern San Andreas Fault and the San Jacinto Fault in Southern California. And there are thousands of different earthquakes that can potentially include rupture on this section of the fault shown in the bottom plot, just a handful of them colored by their rate. So it's a much more complex model, but it's our hope that it better approximate the true complexity of the earth, given the fault network that we have in California that can link in many different ways. Um, so in the previous talk, um, uh, the J Japanese hazard maps were mentioned. I'm showing here a very a rather old hazard map that was uh, had very strict segmentation along the subduction zones that was developed before the 2011 hazard map, which unfortunately ignored the segment boundaries that were drawn and linked up many segments to make a more devastating and larger earthquake than could have happened if those sections had ruptured independently. So this is the kind of thing we want to avoid by including um, multi-fault ruptures in our model. We know that multi-fault ruptures can happen commonly, perhaps even for big earthquakes, even more commonly than single fault ruptures, it seems, given the recent earthquakes that have happened in California and elsewhere in the world. Of course, in Southern California in the 90s, we had the Landers earthquake, which linked up four different faults to form a larger magnitude earthquake that could happen if they ruptured independently. So we include earthquakes like the Landers earthquake in our model. And this connectivity, this linking up of faults really affects the final hazard that our model gives. Um, so here, just for example, I'm showing um, the Cucamonga fault section shown there 
inside the circle on the right. This is a fault section of the Sierra Madre system that's north of San Bernardino in Southern California. In the earlier version of the USERC model that was uh, more segmented, this fault could only rupture by itself. Um, and that meant that you couldn't get an earthquake, as you see on the left, bigger than about magnitude 6.9 on that fault. But in the new version, the newer version of USERF, it can rupture with all of the colored faults shown on the left. So I'm not showing an earthquake there. I'm just showing different faults that can rupture in tandem with this earthquake, with this, with this fault in one earthquake or another, colored by the rate at which they rupture together. And you can see if you look at the USERF 3 magnitude distribution over here on the left, it um, has a much higher uh, roll off. You can have earthquakes up to magnitude eight, although they're not very common. But the important thing is, is because um, both of these models are slip rate balanced, meaning the sum of all these ruptures has to, if you include slip in there, if you integrate over the slip in each rupture and how often they occur, has to be consistent with the overall long-term slip rate of this fault section. So if you allow the Cucamonga fault to rupture um, together with more faults, you essentially can get rid of, uh, take care of a lot of that slip rate in larger earthquakes, and you don't need as many moderate size magnitude six and a half ish earthquakes. So this change actually counterintuitively allowing larger earthquakes in this case lowers the hazard near San Bernardino, because even though there are bigger earthquakes, they happen less often. And on the whole, for most structures, this is a lower, lower um, level of hazard. So connectivity is very important for the end results of the hazard model. And in, in the more recent versions of USERF, we've expanded connectivity at the higher end as well. So we'll actually allow some ruptures to go through the creeping section at a fairly low rate, but it, it can happen even though there is a lot of creep in this area. So this links up Northern and Southern California. So we can have um, much bigger earthquakes possible in the new version of the model than were estimated in the previous version of the model. In addition, the Garlock Fault can link up with the San Andreas and the um, different faults throughout the Ventura and LA basins can link up and the San Andreas can link up with the San Jacinto Fault. And this led to an approximate doubling of the rate of magnitude eight earthquakes, which certainly generated a lot of attention and really affects um, basically the, um, the tail end of that hazard distribution and what the worst events predicted by the model might look like. They would affect a much larger area. So we're now again um, working toward improving this for our next version of USERF that's currently underway, being developed. Um, here on the left is the USERF 3 fault system and the maximum uh, length rupture that each point can be can rupture with. So you can see the San Andreas system is, most connect, is the most well-connected fault here in this network. Now we've been, um, Kevin Milner and others have been working to um, basically make better rules for what ruptures can occur on this, on this fault system. Um, in the previous model, many of these rules were very ad hoc. You know, we had allowed ruptures to jump about five kilometers or so, but it didn't consider how the ruptures themselves were oriented, which is important as to, as to how one fault might stress another, either favorably or unfavorably. So with our new rupture, we're using insight derived from a physics-based simulator that uses um, Coulomb stress interactions to determine what types of rupture jumps are favored and which are disfavored. And so we're hoping that this new um, fault rupture model will be more, um, will have more physics in it and be more, cons more consistent with what might, might actually happen in nature. So that's how we develop the fault-based portion of the model shown here in the middle. And we um, combine all of those different types of data to determine um, the rates, so how often different earthquakes on this fault system occur. But we know, of course, not all earthquakes will occur on the known faults or the mapped faults included in our model. There are a lot of um, small, character, poorly characterized structures or structures we just simply don't know about prior to the earthquake happening. And so we also include um, Back, we call this background earthquakes from derived from seismicity. And we combine the two to get a total model that includes both earthquakes on and off the known modeled faults. Now, I wanna start here with a note of caution. The first is that the, this model in California really partitions what we call on fault and off fault. Here, off fault is really just off the known faults. They're, those earthquakes are also on faults. Um, but this dichotomy between these two parts of the model is really artificial and something we certainly don't think that nature honors. 
We expect, fully expect in the future, there'll be earthquakes like the Kaikoura earthquake in New Zealand that occur partially on faults that we know about and partially on faults we didn't know about or weren't modeling directly. And my other point of caution here is that what we're using to fill in the off-fault por portion of the model is derived from seismicity from historical earthquakes and instrumentally reported earthquakes. So for largest earthquakes, seismicity goes back to say 1800s. And for the smaller earthquakes, it goes back to um, the instrumental era. So since the 30s or so when we've had seismometers detecting these earthquakes. And this is really a shorter term measurement than the fault-based measurement. Um, the, the slip rates, the geodetic measurements and ge geologic measurements that go into the mapped faults of the inversion. So we're potentially combining things that, two data sets that are perhaps relevant at different scales. And I'm gonna come back to this later in the second half of the talk because I think this is potentially an issue. So that's the basic building blocks of the time independent version of the model. From there, we add two layers of time dependence um, to make the final um, fully time dependent version of the model, which is user free ETOS. So the first thing we add, which was alluded to in the previous talk, is elastic rebound along the faults. Even though our model is an unsegmented model where there are many different um, uh, styles of, of linking up faults in different ways. We have a, a met new method we developed during the ESO3 process that allows us to um, apply elastic rebound, meaning after a big earthquake on a fault, it's less likely to have that fault immediately re-rupture um, immediately after that big earthquake, and then that probability will increase in time. But even if the earthquakes are partially overlapping, in our methodology, that probability is just is slightly decreased after a big earthquake, depending on the amount of overlap. Mm -hmm. Our next level is applying um, aftershock clustering. We use the um, epidemic type aftershock sequence model to, uh, to add this. And this type of modeling uses the four main um, scaling laws that are um, in, in seismology. The first is Gutenberg-Richter size scaling. Basically, most earthquakes are small, fewer are big, and this follows an exponential distribution. So this applies to aftershocks as well as all earthquakes. Um, the next is Moria decay that describes how the rate of aftershocks decays in time. We also use the fact that big earthquakes, big main shocks, trigger more aftershocks than smaller ones. And uh, the rate at which aftershocks decay in space. So most aftershocks occur close to their main shock and there's a power law decay. So in this epidemic type modeling, we treat aftershocks like a contagion where they can each infect <laughs> other faults and therefore trigger aftershocks. And those aftershocks can go on to trigger aftershocks of their own in a cascading process. Many generations of aftershocks are possible. You know, it's very similar to epidemic modeling of say COVID-19. Um, we have a parameter branching ratio that's much like the epidemiological R0. If it's less than one, the aftershock sequence eventually dies out, which is typically what happens. Um, there's a small chance that any given earthquake will trigger a main uh, trigger and aftershock bigger than itself. In this case, we renamed the initial earthquake a foreshock and call this aftershock the main shock. But it's the same process that follows the same statistical scaling laws as all the other triggering in the model. A foreshock is really just a main shock whose aftershock is bigger than itself. So we use this um, in our model, and this is the only model I'm aware of in the world that puts an ETOS model with elastic rebound and with, with faults. Um, ETOS modeling has been common for several decades, but we're putting it on faults and we can get fault, we can apply it to fault-based sources. So what that means is, say after an earthquake, like um, the, the Ridgecrest earthquakes here on these two cross faults that occurred a few years ago, here are the primary aftershocks that are triggered. So I'm just showing here the epicenters. And here is all generations. So not just those primary aftershock epicenters, but their, their, their aftershocks that those aftershocks triggered and further generations down. And here you can see that we can really light up the faults. So some of these aftershocks occurred on the Garlock fault, and then aftershocks of those <laughs> large earthquakes are, are the triggered smaller aftershocks, which are the reason that the spot lights up. And some, and less likely, but it could even in some cases trigger the San Andreas, or the Panama Valley system. So 
we can get using ETOS modeling many, um, so this is the average of 100,000 simulations I'm showing here. And we can mine those simulations for statistics as to how likely certain um, outcomes would be. So for example, here's a 50th percentile catalog where we, we sort the catalogs based on the total number of aftershocks triggered. So this is say, a typical scenario you might expect after the Ridgecrest sequence where approximately one magnitude six earthquake is triggered. The 90th percentile event has, um, 90th percentile catalog has three magnitude six triggered. And of course you can continue modeling. You could even, I could even show, for example, the worst of the 100,000 simulations is a doomsday scenario where the Ridgecrest starts off the Garlock Fault, which then um, triggers the San Andreas Fault and the various faults in the LA and Ventura basins. So not very likely this is the very worst catalog of all of them, but we can get an idea of minutes, not just, sorry, not just um, what the typical situation is following a Ridgecrest-like earthquake, but also what the tails of that distribution might look like statistically. So one worry of mine is that in these types of models, we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're combining data at different timescales, and that really influences how the ETOPS model in USERF behaves. So for example, here I'm showing um, various faults in Southern California compared to epicenters of recent seismicity from the last few decades, and also in Southern California. This fault here is the San Andreas fault. It's the fastest moving fault in this system. Based on that, you might expect it to have the most earthquakes. But there are parts of the San Andreas fault that I've highlighted here in these ovals that actually have very few earthquakes currently. And you can interpret that in one of two ways. You can interpret it as, well, right now, the San Andreas is low at all magnitudes, small and large. Or you could interpret it as the San Andreas is a different type of fault that only hosts large earthquakes rather than small earthquakes. Um, the USERF model assumes the second. And because of that, the ETOS triggering behaves very differently than sort of a vanilla basic ETOS model would. So here, considering I'm showing the, um, the um, aftershocks, the distribution of aftershock sizes that would be triggered by two magnitude four earthquakes, one on the San Andreas Fault in a relatively quiet area, and the other on a San Jacinto Fault, which is, has much more activity. These faults have similar slip rates over the long term, but because um, the seismicity rates are so different, the model produces very different size distributions for what um, and what and, and different predictions of what aftershocks these different main shocks might trigger. So you might think a typical ETOS model would say any magnitude four size earthquake, no matter where it is, is going to have a similar propensity to trigger um, a given number of aftershocks. USERF says no. If you trigger, if you have a potential foreshock somewhere that's very quiet, but has a very large rate of say magnitude seven events, that's a case where you should be more worried. So this comes back to the characteristic earthquake hypothesis, which again points to a mismatch between the, uh, the, the recent rate of earthquakes defined from seismicity and the longer term rate of earthquakes from paleoseismology. Um, I've already, I and Karen Fel Felser have argued in our paper that this could also be simply a change in rate um, so it's either a break in scaling or a change in rate, and the community is really undecided as to which it is, but it makes a huge difference, say an order of magnitude difference in this case, for our estimate of what the triggering potential is of a moderate sized earthquake. So it's a very important um, thing to figure out. To what extent is this a break in scaling or is it simply a change in rate? So again, our goal is to conclude is to produce these fault-based forecasts that we currently have for California and the entire Western US for all these faults shown. And we want to go all the way to last estimates. So um, as I showed with the ESA simulations following breadcrust, we can get more than just say a typical or mean scenario following say a, a, a main shock. We can actually give a whole distribution of possibilities here is showing, say, a typical year of um, insured losses in California might look like. So the way to read this is there's a 1% chance of $30 billion of insured losses, but the magnitude seven earthquake has just happened on the San Andreas Fault. There's a one in 10 chance of $30 billion losses. So these tail risks get much higher, and these are really important to quantify 
precisely for things like insurance companies that have to take out um, reinsurance to protect themselves from these kinds of losses. So I'm sure in the next talk, Matt, we'll have more examples of ways in which these probability gains are actionable, but they can be, and quantifying the time-dependent hazard accurately is very important for applications like this. Thanks, Morgan. That was fantastic. Uh, we're going to move on uh, to our next uh, speaker, uh, who is Matt Gerstenberger. He is a seismologist and a principal scientist at GNS Science in New Zealand, where he focuses on earthquake forecasting and seismic hazard modeling with a particular interest in understanding and quantifying uh, uncertainties, uh, developing testable models and actually testing them, and also developing methods for propagate, propagating uncertainties. He has actively worked in seismology in the US, Japan, uh, Europe, and Australia, and is now leading the development of the New Zealand National Seismic Hazard Model. Matt? Thanks very much, Diego. Get my screen up here. Hey, uh, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. My, my talk will be a, a little bit different than the previous two. I will. Um, no, I'm not going to get into any of the details of the models themselves, but I'll talk about some of the modeling results that we've we've done in the last 10 or 15 years and how those have been used um, in various decision making around New Zealand. Um, so first, um, the, the last 20 years in New Zealand has been um, pretty busy in terms of earthquake activity. Um, and I guess this, this is what we've seen in the last 20 years, and you contrast this to the roughly the previous 50 years to this, where there was one moderately damaging earthquake. And in this case, most of these caused at least significant shaking, and quite a few of these were actually damaging earthquakes. And when I was putting these slides together, um, I wanted to identify which earthquakes had occurred in clusters. And I put those into red, and then I quickly realized that almost all of these were in some sort of cluster, just two that are in black here weren't were part of a cluster. And this actually, this, this black one is part of a longer term cluster um, that started before this. Um, and this kind of, this clustering underlines a lot of what I want to talk about today that we see in New Zealand. A lot of this long term clustering where we get big interactions of big earthquakes on kind of uh, years and multi decadal scales. So the, t the type of modeling that we've done that we've done in New Zealand there's been four basic types some of the, these are more or less already been introduced um, but slightly different take on that the first we start out with just kind of statistical models of, of earthquake occurrence and these these really just give the magnitude the rate and the location they don't talk anything about shaking but then the next layer of information that we can put on that is then going into the the hazard and ground motion forecast so that's where we add in the shaking um, and then the next layer we put on to that on top of that is when we start to add into impact. So what happens when these earthquakes occur? Um, and then the final one is scenarios. And what this is, is this is kind of more subjective information. So when you take these, this is giving examples of what maybe these might look like. So what we might expect to occur should one of these particular earthquakes that we've looked at happen. Um, so what I want to talk about today is mostly in, in this space, really focused on the ground shaking forecast, but getting a little bit into the, the risk and also into the, the statistical models. So the, we've, we've been doing this for the last 10 or 15 years or 15 or 20 years, I guess, putting out this type of information. And we've done it really in these short, medium term and long term concepts. I'll talk about this a little bit more, but that's kind of underlying everything that we're doing. And this is just kind of a list of some of the main decision making that has been impacted by decisions at different scales. So starting, say, with um, buildings inspe and building inspections and so on, that's been kind of where things have started to happen at the short term, immediately following um, when a big event occurs. They use this kind of information um, to help decisions around that. Then various other decisions as you get into kind of longer term forecasts, getting out into some kind of very substantial long term decisions impacting um, buildings around. New Zealand, um, and I'll give a couple of examples of those uh, related to the Kaikoura earthquake, which has been mentioned, and also the Canterbury earthquake sequence. Um, <clears throat> this is all I'll say about the modeling, um, but we really, as I've mentioned, we talk about these, these three different timescales quite a bit. First, uh, the aftershocks, which is, um, have already been introduced. This is an image of Fusikichi Omori in 1890, who was the one who really came up with this, or first noticed this particular behavior of aftershock sequences. Um, and 
This is into the medium term clustering. So this is kind of what I showed in that first slide, the term um, clusterings. This is um, work that was first identified by Frank Evison and David Rhodes back in the 1980s. And we still use a lot of those basic scaling ideas um, that they came up with then. They've been developed a little bit since then, but that's mainly where things have stayed. Um, and then we bring that all together with long-term time independent um, side forecast. And I, and I actually, I think I this um, already, but um, long-term and time independent often get used interchangeably. And that's not, that's, that's can be a bit confusing. That's maybe not necessarily what we mean. Um, and some important aspects of this is in these time independent forecasts, the earthquakes are always assumed to be independent of one another in space and time. Um, so very different than these two aspects. Um, and certainly in New Zealand, as I've shown in that first slide, we have strong evidence that the rate variability that we get is much greater than what you would expect from the simple Poisson models that are used for these time independent forecasts. And I'll talk a bit about that. Um, so first starting out with the simple models, these are the ones at the top, these are the statistical models. These are just simple forecasts that we, we can put out based on the aftershock modeling or the, or the combination of all modelings immediately following some sort of main shock. And this is one that we actually put out, um, I think, pretty soon after the, the 2016 magnitude 7.8 Kaikoura earthquake. And it just gives basic information of say, in the magnitude five to 5.9, in the next month, there's a 73% probability that we'll have one or more magnitude 5.9 and a reasonable range would be zero to seven. So quite broad ranges on that. And then it just goes all the way up to magnitude sevens, seven or greater. And we can do this for different time periods. And the next level of information that we add on top of this is then the shaking. And this is just to give kind of additional information for other types of decision making that might happen. And this is just one example of shaking maps that we might produce. And this is again for that, that same forecast period, I think as a previous one. And this is a particularly 30 day forecast of shaking from that. And this is this is this figure shows more or less the entire aftershock region. The main shock was was down here, but it ruptured all the way up into here and aftershocks occurred all over the place. And it's um, all put in context of Wellington. So where I'm sitting right now, the capital city of New Zealand is right here. Um, and it's quite you can see it's quite far. It's right here on this one. It's quite far from where the main shaking or where the main main shock occurred. But there's actually significant damage in Wellington. Um, quite a few buildings had to be brought down from this. So the, the context of the, and this is the main population center in this figure. Um, so the context of these figures was to show what is the probability of experiencing that same level of shaking that we had in Wellington during the main shock again in the next 30 days. And we did this for different time periods. Um, and this shows, so in Wellington, that probability was what, three to 5% which might seem pretty low, but that's three to 5% in 30 days. And that's much significantly higher than it was prior to the occurrence of this Kaikoura earthquake. And you can see when you get closer to the, where the main shock actually occurred, those probabilities of having that Wellington level of shaking again, were, were very high um, at, much, at more than 50%. So then we wanted, there are lots of decisions being made, what things needed to do, lots of buildings had come down and or needed to come down and so on. Lots of buildings needed to be um, inspected. And in New Zealand, there's been big efforts in, in recent years to retrofit um, buildings that were de determined to need it. Uh, um, and just prior to the Kaikoura earthquake, there was a new act put in called the Earthquake Prone Building Act is the language used here for that. Um, and for that, buildings were compared to kind of the relative, the new buildings. So older buildings were compared to the, the new building standard. And if the shaking that they were determined to be able to withstand um, was roughly 33% or less of what a new building should um, be able to withstand. And they were considered to be unsafe and they needed retrofitting. And say in Wellington, they were given about 10 years for that retrofitting to be done. Um, so we just produced these plots that showed, okay, what is the probability in Wellington for a building to experience shaking that is greater than this 33% level that the building, those particular buildings um, were determined to be able to withstand. And again, this is looking at a three month time period for this one, sorry. Um, and this shows that in that three months, there's a 5% probability of receiving shaking that is likely to collapse the building. So that's, it's a low probability. It's actually quite high when you think about that the probability of collapsing the building. And this just shows a relative risk compared prior to the Kaikoura earthquake. So this is showing that it's eight times higher for Wellington at this particular point in time. So the next step was then to, we'd take that from Wellington to take it to the entire region. This is, a, this is actually a year later now. Um, so this is showing over the entire Kaikoura aftershock region, the relative increase in probability of exceeding that 33% threshold and shaking. 
Um, and you can see in Wellington, it's down to 1%. It, it's, 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 um, it's fairly low at that point, um, but it's up to 10 to 15 times in, in the main um, aftershock region. And again, this is the probability of, of exceed, shaking exceeding um, what might bring the build these particular um, unreinforced masonry buildings down. So based on this, this type of information or this, this information here, the government decided to take that 10 year mandatory retrofit time and shorten that to one year. So all these buildings then suddenly had only one year to get this retrofitting done. Um, the government, oh, this is over the entire region. The government kicked in money to do that. And they actually had hundred percent success in getting those retrofits done. Okay, so that was those I've talked about some short term forecasts, the medium term shaking forecast. Now I'll talk a little bit about the long term forecasts. Um, so this is following the Canterbury earthquake sequence. So that that was a sequence that's still going ongoing today, but that started in 2010. And between 2010 and 2012, there were multiple strong shaking events in Christchurch that collapsed buildings, 180 people died, and there is an expectation of that that shaking continue. Continuing, so using the, the PSHA methods that have been talked about already this morning, we um, created these long-term hazard maps that included the short-term, medium-term, and um, long-term um, clustering type ideas. And this is just an example of one of the maps. This shows the peak ground acceleration with a 10% probability of being exceeded in 50 years. And that's a very fairly typical product that's used for building code related decisions in New Zealand. And the, the figure doesn't, there's not a lot of detail here, but it's more or less showing this is the aftershock zone. And if we had the same figure from prior to the, the occurrence of the, the start initiation of the sequence, then this whole region would have been similar to this background color here, which was considered to be a moderate or low hazard area in New Zealand. Um, so it wasn't a total surprise that these happened here. Okay, so then to use that actually for decision making, one of the first places that was used is to determine. So many buildings came down or had to come down in the Christchurch Central Business District because of the, the, the multiple events that occurred. So there's a huge amount of construction going on. So the question was, do, do the new buildings need to be built to a higher standard than they were prior to the kite or sorry, to the, the Canterbury earthquake sequence? Um, so they used the shaking information as kind of the base information for that. Um, so as I mentioned, it's this 10% and 50 year probability of exceedance of a certain ground shaking um, that, that is used for that. And this is just showing a figure of how that particular value changes through time in this time dependent model. So it's saying kind of in the first year um, after this particular model was done, that probability um, of that shaking level was extremely high. And then that shaking level decreases through time till it gets kind of down to some more static background level after a number of years. And it's this, this information that was then used to revise the, the, the shaking requirements um, for new buildings in Christchurch. And this is what it was prior to the occurrence of the sequence and it was revised to this level. So that's the kind of the relative amount of shaking that the buildings needed to be withstand. So it was about a 35% increase, which is quite significant in the, the amount of shaking that these new buildings need to be, needed to be built to. And this is still going today. Um, so some other things that were used um, that this modeling was used for um, was in the in this ongoing sequence there was there was significant amount of liquefaction in the Christchurch area and this liquefaction um, caused a lot of dam land damage a lot of structural damage um, and there's decisions needed to be made about whether or not buildings should be in certain locations given that we actually knew that in the 1800s so these these red zone areas here those those are where significant liquefaction occurred. Um, but we know in the 1800s, all these areas had significant liquefaction that would have done exactly the same thing. So there are questions about whether or not they should really be rebuilding in these particular um, zones. So based on the shaking information plus, plus other things, um, the decision was made that these particular areas, which were, were fairly heavily populated, populated residential areas, um, should no longer be, people shouldn't be living in them. The risk of having to redo all the building um, was just too, too high. So those were essentially evacuated. And I think that they're, they're mostly free. They've become parks essentially at this point. Um, this, the second part um, was rockfall. So this is an old extinct volcano here um, right next to Christchurch. And there was significant rockfall events during multiple shaking events from in this earthquake sequence. So we had boulders the size of sofas that went through people's houses. Um, so the decision making here, I don't have time to go into, but it was a little different. This actually got into some um, very um, much more risk based decision making and that um, actually looked at um, fatality risk to so the probability of loss of life. And if that exceeded some particular threshold, 
then it was kind of based on those kind of commonly used um, thresholds of, uh, I think it was 10 to negative six, the probability of loss of life. Um, it was determined that actually these, these red zone areas here should also be um, vacated due to, to rock fall or um, landslide and so on. Okay, now um, let's just switch gears a little bit and kind of what I mentioned at the beginning and talk about kind of another form of um, time, time dependence, um, thinking about this long-term rate. Um, and current PSHA methods that have been introduced so far um, um, recur on kind of, or depend on kind of the following assumptions. And the first is that earthquake rate is Poissonian. So that means that the earthquake rate is constant in time. So it's the same over these 300 years as it was the 300 years before that and so on. And it doesn't really vary a lot um, during that time or within some, some con very constrained um, variability. Um, and also a key one is that the long the longest time length of the earthquake catalog or whatever data set that we have available to constrain the hazard is representative of the long-term rate. I won't go into the, the second one as much, um, but this is actually a pretty critical one in terms of understanding the uncertainty around that. That's a, that's a pretty big assumption. Um, okay, so this slide is pretty complicated, but there's just a few key messages here that um, hopefully I can communicate well. And the, really the key question that we wanted to look at here is how variable is the rate from one time period to the next time period. So we've looked at a number of places around the world. I'll show New Zealand and Japan. And just the way that this works, say if we look at 50 here, we went and we grabbed 50 events from the catalog. We looked at however long that occurred, say that was 18 months, that those 50 earthquakes make greater than magnitude four occurred. We looked then at the next 18 months, so the same time length period, and count the number of events that occurred in that time period, and we plot that as one point on here. So if we had 50 in the first um, time period, and we had 50 in the second time period, that falls right here in the center. Sorry, this is the log scale. I should have put the other one. Up. Shows the log ratio. So this is at, at one and at zero, sorry, that means they were the same. And at, at one, that means you had 10 times more in the second time period, and a negative one, that means you had 10 times fewer in the second, uh, in the second period. So, so, um, you, so this would mean you either had 50, here you had 50 in the first and 500 in the second or five in the second. So it's showing there's quite significant variability in that. Um, and I guess the important aspect, the important part of this is here are the 99% confidence bounds on our observations. So I know there's, there's a significant amount of variability and the plus on assumption, which is a basis of pretty much all hazard calculations is down here. So it's showing we have almost an order of magnitude greater variability in the observations than we use in kind of typical um, PSHA calculations. And this becomes particularly important when we're looking at low seismicity areas. And it's also not the same everywhere around the world. Um, and maybe in California and Italy, we don't see quite this um, strong variation that we do see in New Zealand and Japan. So we're currently looking at ways to get this into the hazard modeling and considering alternatives to the, the Poisson assumptions. Um, so this is my last slide, and I'll just, I think I'll just sum up the, the top two points here. Um, and I guess the, the key thing is um, we can do these time-dependent hazard calculations. We can put them out in lots of different ways. But to be used, then the users need to be ready to use them. And a, a couple of um, challenges that we've run into, particularly we've done these long-term forecasts for Christchurch and for Kaikoura. And for those, those to be used, then the end users may use certain models that say, okay, if we get this level of shaking, what's going to happen to a particular building? And those buildings assume, those models, sorry, assume that they're only going to get one earthquake and that one earthquake may or may not collapse the event or collapse the building, sorry. Uh, but in these time dependent models, we might actually get multiple earthquakes that are capable of collapsing a building. So for example, you might get in a particular loss model of financial damage, you might get a particular building collapsing multiple times, which obviously doesn't make sense if you're talking about a, a short time period. So you're you're inflating your losses, so your loss estimates won't be very uh, won't be very good. They'll be over over too high. Um, so there's some work that needs to be done, not just on the the development of the time dependent hazard models, but how they're how they're used. Um, and I think I will stop there. Thanks very much. Thanks, Matt. Um, that was great. I, I think it's time to move on uh, to the panel session with uh, Morgan and um, and Richard and, and Marco. And uh, I'll, I'll ask the committee uh, first if they have any questions, but maybe I'll abuse the power of the microphone to ask the first question, uh, which is also the, one of the same questions that's in the Q&A. Uh, you couldn't see it, Matt, but everybody's eyebrows in the room went up when you talked about how the time uh, for mandated retrofits went down from 10 years to one year. Um, 
because of the of the forecast. And for for us in the U.S., this is a problem, especially for places like the Pacific Northwest, where there's a lot of uh, unreinforced masonry structures that that persist. So the, one of the questions from the audience was, what advice do you have for compelling the government um, to help out in some meaningful way uh, with issues like this one? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, I'm not sure I really have a good good answer for that. I think we were we were lucky in New Zealand that our that our government was um, kind of open to these ideas. I think probably where that came from was they saw the significant amount of damage to these types of buildings in Christchurch, which had happened just um, five years before that. So they were aware of the consequences and the significant amount of damage that can happen to these these unreinforced masonry buildings when you have that type of shaking. I think one of the, the challenges we did have a little bit, um, which isn't really answering the question, but was in the Kaikota earthquake in Wellington, we do have a significant amount of these unreinforced masonry buildings, but the, the particular frequency of the shaking in Wellington um, from the Kaikoura earthquake was actually kind of long period. That's where the hot, the high shaking was. So the, 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 these unreinforced masonry buildings flew through with no problems whatsoever. So we had to do a lot of work educating um, kind of the, the decision makers. And I think our, our kind of our, our buildings at the building authority did a lot of work on this to, to explain different earthquakes affect buildings in different ways. And just because we didn't see these damage in, in to the Kaikoura earthquake to, to these unreinforced masonry buildings. It's because of the differences in the type of shaking and that we have these examples in Christchurch um, where kind of shorter period, high frequency shaking does bring that down. And we know that happens. And we, we have these good catalogs of these buildings around the city. Right. Sorry, that's not very helpful. Thank you. Um, by the way, if, if somebody else from the panel uh, wants to fill in in any of these questions, please just raise your hand and uh, I'll, I'll call upon you if you want to add something else. Um, Rengen? Um, you have a question? Thanks. Um, can you hear can me? Can you hear me? I, I, I unmuted myself now. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, um, Morgan, actually, my question to you, when you show the Western U.S. and um, California, all the earthquake distribution, how this would affect the um, the end results. I was, when you were showing the map, I started thinking about what other uh, seismological findings can help you, like such as source parameters, like energy, uh, because that's a big problem. We are trying to understand the contribution of, we have the magnitude, then there's energy. How, if you kind of put those together, can this help to uh, sort of identifying the problem? Or what are the other research needs that could help formulating this? Well, certainly the whole the model is moment balanced. So we do have a target amount of moment that all the earthquakes in the model have to basically add up to within within a large region. So that's why um, if you do something like remove large events on enough faults and don't allow them to link up, you have this thing where you need a lot more moderate size events basically to match that moment. Um, I do think the issue though is, even though we are, <laughs> we are trying to constrain moment, it has huge uncertainties. Um, one way to get the moment is from um, just the geodetic models, the total amount of strain in the system, but that could easily be off by a factor of two or three, depending on these, you know, what's the coupling, how much of it is aseismic. So even that, <laughs> that's probably our most direct measure um, can have really big uncertainties. The other thing we try to look at is just um, historical seismicity. And if you add up all of that, what's the total moment of the earthquakes we've observed? But as Matt pointed out in his talk, that can also be dramatically off, um, probably not as much as an order of magnitude, like he was saying, but it could just be that um, the last 150 years or so on the West Coast has been really anonymous, anonymously quiet. quiet. And there's some evidence of that. If you look at um, the rate and like at all the paleo seismic trenches that our model wants to put in earthquakes and you compare it to um, the observed rate and just what's happened in the last century, which is that no earthquakes have hit those trenches. It does seem like there's something anonymously low about the last century or so in California and also in New Zealand, strangely enough. So I think there's a lot of work there to be done to be understanding exactly how we can better constrain that energy balance in the models. I think, um, Torsten, you have a question? 
another question to to Morgan. Uh, I wonder if you could explain a little bit more how you go from the ETAS type statistics that doesn't have geometrical information to the triggering scenarios where all of a sudden, you know, the fault lights up, sort of to go from a blob to this rock-like scenario of a Cali-wide rapture. Yeah, so the way it works is um, the ETAS model, um, you know, has a certain number of aftershocks that are drawn from like a random seed based on, you know, first generation aftershocks based on the size of the main shock. And then it picks, um, you know, there's a distance decay where most of them will be close in. So it basically picks the location. And then for that location, um, we have a set of sources. Some of them will be those background sources that are off the model fault. And some of them will include um, long ruptures. What we assume in USERF is that for every like rupture along a fault, the epicenters, that, that can rupture in many different ways and the epicenters are basically uniform distributed. So we don't assume that it's more likely that for a given section rupture, it'd be more likely to rupture on one hand or the other. We just assume the simplest thing, which is that epicenters are uniform. Those are all kind of unique earthquakes and we pick one in the ETAS mm -hmm. model. So it means that um, those aftershocks are gonna preferentially be located in places where the model has earthquakes. Unlike sort of a very basic vanilla ETAS model, you get like, if you have a main shock, the aftershocks are just like kind of uniformly spread out <laughs> in a uh, spatially isotropic way. In USERF, that isotropy is broken based on where the background model puts, puts the earthquakes, which tends to be on faults. So that's how you get right. those like beautiful pictures of the faults lighting up because of that yeah. isotropy breaking. I think, uh, Jeff, do you have a question? Yeah, so um, uh, put, give this one to, to Richard and Marco, uh, but the others might want to chime in as well. In terms of moving from a time-independent to time-dependent uh, models, uh, limiting factors could be in data availability or the physical understanding of interactions or the computational uh, limits. Uh, which of these are actually the biggest problems? Uh, might vary from place to place, but uh, is it lack of data, lack of physical understanding, or a lack of computation? Marco, you want to start? I've, I, I can say my thoughts. Um, you go, Richard, and then I can add the case. Okay. So um, I will say that um, I think the lack of a, um, a sort of decent computational framework um, that's widely applicable. Uh, the ETAS is, is a great start in the work that um, that Morgan and uh, Ned and Kevin have been doing in California is amazing. Um, and, um, but, but it's, you know, everyone has to more or less go through and implement that from scratch if they're going to do it and they may want to do something else. California also, of course, has about as much data as you can, as you can reasonably expect on earth, um, similar to Japan. Um, uh, so, but in the absence of data, you know, you can use priors, you can use other ways of sort of, you know, uh, bounding things or filling in data gaps. Um, and um, computational complexity is important, but that, you know, I think, I think that goes with the computational framework you use. I think really starting to develop um, techniques that can be, um, uh, yeah, really just developing the computational models um, and seeing what happens. Once you start doing that, then you can look at where your pain points are and adjust things. But I think they're really just just getting started with it all is the, is um, probably the biggest roadblock, at least for us. We'll probably be doing it in the next couple of years. So I might have a better idea of um, what I'm really banging my head into, um, you know, in two years. Um, Marco, do you want to add on to that? Yeah, well... Yeah, f the first uh, thing that is uh, missing is time, I would say, <laughs> unfortunately, because we are uh, definitely extremely busy. But uh, of the three that we, you've been mentioning, Jeff, I would say that data, in my opinion, is the most limiting one. So when you move away from uh, California, Japan, New Zealand, and a few other places, uh, the amount of information and the quality of the information that is available is... Uh, one order of my lower. And I think that uh, uh, we already have problems in developing, uh, let's say, more standard time independent models. Uh, so when you go to time dependent models, uh, uh, clearly the lack of information uh, is posing big problems uh, in the calibration of the earthquake occurrence models. 
And the more we learn, even in well, uh, well studied regions like uh, New Zealand, as, as uh, Matt was saying, about, for example, the stability of the rates uh, throughout time, clearly this is posing problems in, uh, in areas where, where information is far lower than the one that we have in those areas for the calibration, again, of, of the models. Um, Mark, uh, do you have a question? Yeah, um, well, actually, Jeff somewhat asked mine, but um, this is Richard, and you mentioned these process based models, and you were talking about the computational challenges. And I guess my question kind of spins off of Jeff's little bit in where do you see the kind of the next steps in terms of really learn like are we are we limited by the physics that we're trying to put into those models or again is it really a computational challenge you have to go to these complex finite element based models for viscoelasticity rate and state friction i'm just kind of wondering where you see the breakthroughs in that area coming and and what are the limitations my um uh, where I think the, the 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 sort of optimal next path lies is is being able to use. Um, I don't think that that you know taking a simple physics model, a simple taking a, a you know a straight physics model and and letting it run for a zillion years is is how we want to do PSHA. So what we want to do is be able to use physical models um, to to sort of transfer those into statistical models that we can apply. Um, so like, um, you know, Morgan mentioned using RSQ SEM as getting better ways of understanding stress, stress transferring that can then tell you from a statistical standpoint, the fault A ruptures is fault B, you know, going to be positively or negatively stressed by that individual rupture and understanding the conditional dependence is better. Um, then, um, so I think that that kind of yeah, you know, being able to develop Green's functions or being able to develop, um, you know, different sort of statistical approximations based on on physics, um, better understanding of fault reloading from, you know, um, tectonics versus viscoelasticity versus after slip, um, you know, and instantaneous, you know, elastic Coulomb stresses, um, understanding the relative com uh, combinations of, of both of, of all of those lets us implement reloading in a statistical manner that should be doing a better approximation of, uh, of the different physical mechanisms. I, I wanna ask a question before I let Torsten ask his question and it's that um, nobody spoke about uh, geodesy and I'm thinking specifically about uh, slow slip events and there's you know, compelling evidence that they play a role in, in moderating the, the earthquake cycle. So maybe I'll, I'll point this one I, either Morgan or, or Matt if you wanna grow the seismic hazard map to Cascadia, you have to account for that. In Kaikoura, there were very big slow slip events following um, the main shock. So how do we um, deal with this extra phenomenon? I think Matt should answer that too, because they de dealt with that at Wellington. Yeah. Um, yeah, so as you, as you mentioned, post Kaikoura, so we have kind of regular ongoing slow slip around the Hickeringi um, interface. And there's kind of three or four patches that regularly go at <clears throat> intervals from six months to some years. And post Kaikoura, and I guess in a key part of that is there's a locked patch that in the 25 years that we've had geodetic data, right, the Hikarangi just right below my feet right now has never moved. Um, but everything around it is moving. And post Kaikoura, we saw something we'd never seen before that immediately all of those slow slope patches started, started moving together. Um, so there were some questions being asked about what did that imply for, for the locked patch beneath me right now. And there, there weren't, aren't any existing methods. This isn't a problem that anybody had really considered um, before. Um, so we, we put together some pretty simple physical statistical models and looked at evidence from, from catalogs that we had in terms of combining slow slip catalogs with triggering potential and so on. Um, but there's there's clearly a lot of work that needs to be to be done there. And I would hope some of the the dynamic rupturing models can get a bit more into that space. And I think that's where we need to head for that that, that sort of work. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, Torsten. A bit of asking the the same question as to our ability or absence thereof of linking the statistical 
behavior of the fault system to the present day state. You know, for example, Morgan mentioned, you know, there are these these well known patches along the San Andreas that are you know, show way less seismicity than others, and there are physical models saying that you know, this could mean something in terms of where the fault is in terms of the cycle, say in a rate and state framework. And I was just wondering, you know, um, given the uncertainties, where do you think more specifically opportunities to go from what the system tells us right now to inferring within uncertainties what that means about the state, right? And so there's different ways. One is the, the history dependence, the viscoelastic loading. Another one is maybe a fault constitutive law. Where where are some of the opportunities to advance beyond saying, oh, well, the system should do that right now. It doesn't look like it. What does that mean? As, you know, to everybody, but in particular, Morgan, sort of following up on your last couple of slides where you had already expressed, you know, your, you know, some ideas there. Yeah, I mean, basically everything we're doing in the model is statistical currently, although we are using the simulators for insight. There has been a lot of talk about in future having RST sim be a branch of like a logic tree branch of the model, if we can get to that point that we trusted enough to use it for that. And Risha has even did work of taking RST sim all the way to like making a hazard map from it. And it actually looks pretty similar to use of three in part because the attenuation relations kind of spread everything out, smear everything. Um, but yeah, the, the, I, I don't know that anyone has looked into using it in a time dependent way. That would just be using RSD sim for the time independent portion of the catalog, running it for millions of years and taking some average after you spin it up. So there has not been much work of actually like, is there a way to put RSD sim into the state or any simulator? into the state like what we see now, or to run it in such a way that has huge amounts of variability, then mine that variability and just pick out the parts that look like today, which maybe that right. is more of like the way you could go about it. But how do you get the whole yep. state to look like it is today? Maybe one part of it, one part of it, one catalog looks like, you know, the <laughs> Carrizo looks quiet, but then there's a whole other part of the catalog where, I mean, you certainly get elastic rebounds. So you could get like, is there a way to like put in the historic earthquakes and get that shut down that looks like what we did today. but I don't have any way to like force the model to do that or to mine in a way where like as a whole, like over the whole large region you're considering, it would look like it does today. Yeah, but I guess turned around, it is, it, it does the physical model that sort of underlies, or the statistical model that underlies all of the hazard assessment, does that show the sorts of states we're seeing right now? It is very and, hard, you know, yes. It is very hard to get the level of rate change you would have to use to explain 150 years later why those areas in, on the San Andreas are still that deficient. You could easily get a factor of three rate change from just an ETOS model with Bassanian background. Factor 10, you're going to have to throw out the Bassanian background. You need something else, physics in there, or maybe like time varying background rate, which is not really a background in the strict sense, so more like the stuff that Matt alluded to. Like, um, yeah, we, we don't have that, that model yet, but aftershock triggered alone, you, you need something else, maybe a lower, I showed in my paper, like with a lower B value and aftershock triggering, you could barely explain it, but it's really kind of a just so story of like, yeah, you have to put a lower B value in San Andreas and you'd have to put in like the maximum aftershock variability from, or variability from aftershock triggering. It's close, but it's, it's hard to explain without something else which is why we don't assume it's a rate change, we assume it's a break in scaling. So well, if, I can, if I can add to that briefly, yeah. I, I think that, that one thing that, that um, I would like to see, um, and I think many of us would, is, is really having the physics-based models um, uh, run in ways that can make sort of generalized predictions on on the sort of states that we observe and comparing those to observations so we can understand what physics exactly would we want to add that can replicate, you know, things like like faults looking quiet over long periods of time, plate boundary faults that, that don't show much seismicity. You know, some physical mechanisms may predict that and some may not, but, you know, they may require a certain amount of complexity dealing with other, you know, complex rheologies, lots of other faults, interaction and stuff like that in order to um, uh, be realistic and useful. So I think that, you know, some from, from the sort of geodynamical modeling community, some hypothesis testing um, and prediction make, making could really help us 
understand where the most useful avenues and, and, and um, you know, what paths may not be as, as useful in the future. I want to make sure I ask uh, one question from the audience before we go on to the break. Um, Luciana Astiz asks uh, whether at subduction zones, any of the models consider the stress transfer from other phenomena such as intermediate depth um, earthquakes or only the effects of, of rupture or non-rupture of, of adjacent segments. Um, I don't know if maybe Morgan or Matt want to tackle that one. We actually, do, yeah, don't consider that in user three. The subduction zone is handled entirely separately, unfortunately. It's just a deficiency of the model. And it's in, in New Zealand, we we can't can't ignore it. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a kind of one of the largest contributors to our hazard. But we do, for the for the basic PSHA work we're doing, we're, the ruptures are essentially treated independently. So you're, what you're um, asking about is not handled. In the slow slip work that I talked about and trying to understand the triggering potential there, we did consider the effects um, that you're, you're talking about with fairly simplistic models, but that was kind of a key part of what we were looking at. Okay, thank you guys. Well, I wanna thank all the speakers, Marco, Morgan, uh, Matt, and Richard. We're going to take a short break until 2.50 p.m. Eastern Time, and uh, we will reconvene then. Thank you. Hello, so it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second session this afternoon. Uh, we are now connecting the time dependent hazard to uh, loss, impacts and risks. We have great speakers and really exciting topics. This um, upcoming uh, speakers. Our first talk is by uh, Dr. David Walt and Dr. Kishore Jaswal. Um, Dave is a research geophysicist at the US Geological Survey. He's involved in research development operations of several real-time earthquake information systems at the USGS NEIC. He developed and manages ShakeMap and Did You Feel It? and is responsible for developing other systems for post-earthquake response and pre-earthquake mitigation, including ShakeCast. Uh, Kishore is a research structural engineer at the US Geological Survey. He leads the development of pager systems, earthquake casualty and economic loss estimation models, and the development of earthquake risk related products for building and critical infrastructure. He has also contributed to jam development efforts by participating in and contributing to the number of jams earthquake risk related projects. Dave Kisher, to you. Thank you. I'll share my screen. And second. How's that sound? How's that look? Okay, good. All right, thanks. This is a great opportunity. I really appreciate the chance to do this. Um, I'm a seismologist. Kishore is a structural engineer. And we're going to help take this from the uh, realm of the hazard into the potential impacts and then some of the uses, some of the users. Matt, Matt Gersenberg already started on that path, and it really is great to see the, the presentations on the hazard front. Uh, I, I should say that this is not exactly our area of specialties. <laughs> uh, so what we did, rather than try to focus on the systems that we work on directly, and connect those to uh, the hazard that's time dependent, we are actually going to do a little bit different uh, approach here. We're going to take uh, what we know about losses and risks and try to put together a small book here called um, time dependent hazard and loss risk for dummies. And the reason we're doing this is we really need to, uh, our, it's sort of our own self edification in terms of uh, understanding the, the relationships of time dependent hazard and the, and the uses that are out there. I, I haven't seen a lot of collective information about this. And so we're gonna try to put this together on our own. Before I start, uh, usual disclaimer, we're gonna mention some uh, different firms and different companies working on this. So that doesn't represent a, um, an endorsement by the US government and our opinions are our own and not representing necessarily the USGS. So uh, table of contents, uh, briefer on financial decision-making and then some examples and timeframes of uh, 
time dependent loss. Well, uh, everyone that's talked about this has talked about different time frames, and I'm looking at this from an earthquake cycle perspective, so decades, centuries, and longer. Induced earthquakes, which can be last for months and years, depending on the, the um, injection rate and other things. Earthquake sequences, as we talked about, and then aftershock sequences. And I think it's an easy way to break up the time scale of these things in terms of how they're used. Uh, I, I'm not gonna go through these acronyms, but a couple important glossary uh, entries. One is uh, we've seen loss equals hazard times exposure times vulnerability. But I wanna make sure that we are clear that risk involves a probabilistic hazard. So Keisha and I do a lot of loss estimation where we have the hazard at hand. It's a shape map. It, it's an uncertain hazard, but we use that to look at the exposure vulnerability and get an uncertain uh, impact or, or loss. And that's challenging enough. When you put the probabilistic hazard in front of that, um, then you're adding an additional uncertainty term. We have to recognize that you know, the loss component itself is, is very challenging. So we, we need to think about these things. Um, and then I, I mentioned that reinsurance uh, is insurance from, uh, for insurers. And the important point here is that uh, insurance is based on you know, statistics of large numbers and, and more regular occurrence. And the reinsurers are really interested in the, the tail end of the, of the loss curve. And so they're very interested in these, these low probability events and getting that right is, is of utmost importance to the financial sector. And a lot of the technology, a lot of the um, analysis in this realm is actually done in, in the financial sector. So um, we've, we've used uh, our ShakeMap pager tools and handed that off to a number of different financial entities. And I, I just like the slide because it gives us a sense of who's using it for what. And obviously disaster aid and response and media presence are clear, but a lot of our users are in this risk and financial uh, risk management at realm. And that's, again, a lot where this research is being done. Um, and so the insurers, the reinsurers, and all the risk modelers that are involved with getting rates out of these dependent, time-dependent, independent models uh, are really thinking about this problem a lot and, and applying it in, in, the, uh, in the real world sense. One of the things on top of the, the usual insurance and reinsurance um, realm is, is cap bonds. You may or may not have heard of cap bonds, but catastrophe bonds are, are really a large part now of the, um, at least in the earthquake realm, uh, the possible insurance products that are available to different entities. And effectively, they're, they're uh, insurance products that are sold by an entity um, and, and like a government or a city of Tokyo or country of Mexico. And um, again, a risk modeling firm calculates the odds of that disaster occurring, just like you would in a, in a long-term insurance product. And then the investors get paid a fairly high rate of investment, but they could lose their principal if the disaster hits. And whether or not this bond is paid out uh, and what the cost of the bond is all determined by these, these nice hazard maps and, and now turning towards more time-dependent components. But the USGS is also interested in this because we are the independent entity that determines whether this earthquake uh, of interest triggered a particular loan. And uh, as, I, as I should mention, is, is a huge amount of uh, financial investment in these things out there. And so they're pretty important to know about. The difference, about, uh, difference between cat bonds and regular insurance or reinsurance is that cat bonds are, are triggered parametrically and then it can be paid out immediately after an earthquake. So a lot of different groups use ShakeMap or they use NEIC, National Earthquake Information Center's magnitude location to trigger this bond uh, or this payout rather than waiting for uh, what is typically known as indemnity insurance, where you actually look at the damage and see, uh, add up the claims over time and, and, and provide uh, coverage. So this is a much faster way to provide resources after a major disaster and it's become very popular to do so. Uh, and these things do get triggered. This is a, 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 a NEIC uh, magnitude location triggered $200 million payout for Peru and, um, and Ecuador has had a similar payout and other countries have uh, Mexico and among others uh, over the years. So these are um, kind of important to understand that, you know, money makes the world go around. And in a lot of the business here, a lot of the uses of the downstream information is used in the insurance, reinsurance and um, and these other financial sectors. There's some, uh, I did a, a little summary of this, but there's a really good report out by the OECD on financial uh, risk management. And, and it's, it's an excellent way to get, get up to speed on this particular topic. But the, the main fo focus here is really the uses of these, um, these different timeframe um, 
potential time dependent uh, hazards. And um, some of them, let me just move this. Some of the uh, users and uses and types of decisions that are made, Matt covered a little bit, but let's just look at these in terms of timeframes. We have basically the uh, long-term PSHA, which is of course used for insurance and research, planning, uh, mitigation, building codes, but also these cap bonds and, and a lot of risk analyses. There's nothing, nothing surprising there. Uh, induced earthquakes now brings things down to a much shorter time frame, and there too, insurance is uh, relatively responsive to that kind of time frame. Uh, and, and yet, um, there's not a lot that changes in the in the longer term picture uh, for most products, uh, including building codes on the induced earthquake front. But industry regulations certainly are dependent on these kinds of um, observations, and so that's a, a different time frame. When we get to earthquake sequences. Um, then, uh, as Matt mentioned, you know, there's there's a lot that can be done uh, as long as there's some confidence in the in decision making and the confidence in the uh, in the science, which is our biggest challenge here. And so, evacuation preparedness, um, even staying outside under certain circumstances in, in vulnerable places, supplying uh, relief supplies, getting them ready, other forms of mitigation, and then looking at building degradation, like uh, like Matt mentioned, and we'll talk about a little bit more. And also in the course of the earthquake sequence, people ask the question, what if? You know, what if something bigger happens or what's next? And the use of scenarios in that case is extremely important to try to um, edify, give people some information about what might be coming. Uh, and then lastly, the aftershock sequence, of course, here we have um, basically very important needs for knowing what's next and what may happen. And so the urban search and rescue and other people on the ground Building tagging and other people that are that are in the field. Uh, so this could also um, uh, include shoring up buildings and looking at the changes in building vulnerability, uh, potentially evacuations, and also uh, reconnaissance plans. I, I mentioned equities, um, market decisions, and ILS, which is uh, insurance-linked securities. There may be also financial decisions that are being made rapidly and on the fly that that we're not aware of. Cap bonds are publicly traded, so we know these but there's probably also financial decisions being made on the fly uh, as we put out aftershock uh, warnings and, and statistics. Uh, and I also mentioned here that I think personally, um, and we, this is fodder for the discussion, that you know, these things go from easier to harder as you go back in time and back over time scales. And, and the reason I, I say that is, that, of course, an aftershock sequence or earthquake sequence is the, the, the main location, the main uh, region and time frame has already been set. Something's already happened. With induced earthquakes, in fact, you have a, a regional footprint that, that's likely to be affected. But with earthquake cycles, both the time and the, um, and the space is, is complete uh, a question mark, but there's, there's a lot more to that story. So uh, earthquake cycles, we've actually been using uh, time dependent um, risk uh, hazard assessments for risk and loss calculation for some time now. This is a 2008 paper for the World Conference. And, and again, this came out of the RMS group. So uh, the risk modeling community has been on top of this for some time. And this is just the change from the, uh, the ratio from what would be a time dependent, time independent to a time dependent uh, residential losses in California. And of course, things like uh, the Hayward Fault and the Southern San Andreas Fault all the way down in the Salton Sea light up and are substantially higher than the background rate. And so these things have been appreciated in industry and, and modeled for some time. Uh, the challenge is always how good are the input models, but the, the, the engine for computing these are, is, is certainly there. Um, when it comes to induced earthquakes, there too, um, there's been some great work on looking at risk uh, taking the hazard that's very, very time dependent. Uh, the map on the lower right shows the um, basically the hazard map uh, for a particular uh, time period, 10% uh, uh, annual per, uh, exceedance for 2015 versus what's happened more recently when the uh, seismicity has gone down. And this is an enormous change in the, in the rate of, of uh, background information, a background level of seismicity that turns into very, very different uh, loss estimates. And these are AAL annual, uh, average annualized losses. And for 2015, um, obviously people were very worried and things came back down. 
Interestingly, when you look at a map of the annualized loss over that year, um, it, it, the, the thing that shows up here is not the areas of really high induced events, but really the exposure in Oklahoma City with respect to those events. And so in areas where there's very little to expose, obviously the seismicity is going up, but the risk is not going up because the exposure is, is so low. Here is where the exposure really is concentrated. And of course, over the um, background rate or uh, compared to a more return to close to normal and the peak in 2015, the annualized rates are, are very, very different in terms of loss estimates. We, we can also use these opportunities to, to help people plan for earthquakes. And we've got a, a new uh, application called Consequence Driven Scenarios, where uh, in this case, the Oklahoma's Department of Transportation wants to know, you know what if situations, and they want in particular to exercise multiple of their um, other divisions after an earthquake and wanna know what kind of earthquake may come and cause that type of problem. So we can actually solve for uh, the most likely earthquake, which is the lowest magnitude that occurs at these division boundaries that would constitute damage to several other bridges. And so they're very concerned about the time dependent hazard that, that they've seen and now they're interested in, in doing something in, on the form of mitigation and planning. And so we can, we can help them with these types of scenarios when we see these elevated areas of, uh, of seismicity. When we look at sequences, uh, Matt did a great job covering some of this. There's other places in the world that are highly uh, uh, sequence driven. Uh, Central Italy is certainly one of them. And a lot of work has been done in Italy on the, on the combination of um, time dependent and, and uh, time independent hazard. And the upper plot in the, is simply showing that the difference between annualized losses in the active period of a, of a sequence in, the, in Central Italy versus what happens with just a Poisson background and what it would compare in a random year uh, looking at time dependent and time independent calculations. So these things are being done fairly routinely. And I, I think this is a, a great example of um, of now being recognizing the time dependence in, in, in rate calculations. Also in Central Italy, I won't spend much time on this. The, um, again, there's, uh, when you start looking at ETAS and adding that to the, the background rate, you get much higher uh, potential for losses. And in this kind of calculation, people are looking now, not only at, um, at the change in rate from the time, time uh, dependent perspective, but also looking at what would happen if the earlier event damaged the structures. And what happens then is you get, uh, you go from having an impact, intact structure to the damaged structure and the chances of your having exceeding collapse probabilities uh, go up dramatically when you start with a building that's damaged to different degrees as is done in this calculation. Um, also in Italy, uh, there's operational um, earthquake uh, forecasting that's being done in the background and it, the, the, the fully functional, uh, again, dependent on the input model, but um, uh, our colleague Inyo Ervelino has been working on this and this is something that the civil protection has been aware of and, and, and looking at for some time. And what you find and, and what's always challenging about these calculations is when you can do the, the model from end to end and you get a uh, probability of collapse over some time period, in this case, a week, and that probability is very time dependent, depending on what's going on with the background seismicity. But the challenge is always this, and that is the, the background rate changes with time, but you don't see an increase in the background rate until something substantial happens. And so, again, the difference between operational earthquake forecasting and aftershock forecasting sort of come to the, to the uh, front here, where at this point, you can tell there's a high change, but that's also because the largest event in the sequence has happened there. Um, and, and then lastly, uh, aftershock sequence here, uh, for some time now, work's been done on looking at the risk changes for aftershock sequences. Largest one is this Tohoku event where obviously a magnitude nine is gonna have uh, potentially very, very damaging uh, magnitude sevens and eights uh, over a long period of time. And that's certainly the case in these calculations can be computed and used for uh, AAL and, and changes in, in, um, in, in rates for, for customers. Uh, Kishore, do you want to take over and talk about the this very important topic of having structures damaged from the pre from the main shock and what happens in the subsequently? 
Great. Thank you so much. <clears throat> That's a great background, Dave. Uh, I'm, I'm so excited to join here. And again, another disclaimer from my side is, although I'm an engineer, I'm not representing the entire body of and spectrum a spectrum of engineering concerns that basically look at these problems. As a student of uh, this problem, I have great opportunity to learn working closely with USGS scientists to think about these problems, think about the long and complex earthquake sequences and how the engineers should think about uh, modeling these sequences through damage and loss and risk. So this example shown here on your right uh, is basically two earthquakes happening back to back magnitude 5.9 and 5.8 in central Italy. And as you can imagine, uh, depending upon which location you are building or you are, uh, the, the amount of shaking will be very different. And essentially what it means is that uh, a, a building which is located close to the second shock may experience a much stronger shaking than the first shock, even if the magnitude of the first shock is higher. And thus there is usually the conundrum here is that typically seismologists tend to say that the aftershocks will be smaller and they would decay over time. Yes, that is very true. But where those aftershocks are happening and how intense the ground shaking could be at a given location, if those assets are directly sitting on top of those locations, those structural demands could be significantly higher. And the right-hand side of that panel is basically a composite shake map of the two earthquakes, which highlights that in any given typical earthquake sequence, there could be multiple such cycles uh, which the structures could be exposed. And there could be a lot of complexity in terms of how the structure will behave, depending upon, uh, if you think about the left-hand side panel, motion one may be weaker, which induces some level of damage to the structure and essentially uh, create additional problems to the structure if the second motion happens to be even st stronger than the first motion. So this, this problem, as the seismologists are interestingly studying about the time-dependent earthquake uh, uh, predictions, uh, engineers are not uh, left behind here. Many of my colleagues in academic and research community have started looking into this problem over 10 years ago. Uh, and the, the process of developing these models uh, have, have evolved over time, which I will discuss in the next slide. Essentially, what engineers have done is, is look at the structural system and develop a numerical model of that structural system and try to expose this set of records as main shock and aftershock combinations. Before I explain this damage dependent fragility modeling, let me make a quick remark here. The design philosophy, uh, the building code design philosophy has heavily relied on probabilistic hazard models that have come out from USGS hazard mapping team. And those are basically time independent hazard models. That means that the potential of seeing a multiple rounds of strong shaking in a, in a small amount of time is discarded because it's not considered in the hazard modeling. And thus a typical, the engineer's traditional way of thinking about this is if you are de designing for a very high, very strong earthquake, something like an MC level earthquake, which happens every 2,500 years or you're designing for a particular set of target ground motion, which would give you an expected performance of collapse that you want to design for, then typically the, the impact of this sequence of earthquakes and the aftershocks would not be directly considered into the design consideration. However, the, my academic community have been looking two at this minutes. problem more carefully. And uh, the, the example here are showing basically Mira Raghunandan's work on reinforced concrete frame, looking at the main shock and aftershock uh, combination time histories uh, to expose into the structural models and evaluate the, the building performance, uh, which is essentially dependent upon the first level of damage or second level of damage, how the second level basically induce uh, further damage or potential collapse in the structure. Next slide, please. Again, uh, uh, Professor Henry Burton and his colleagues have looked at this problem specifically for a code defined reinforced concrete structure in which they develop uh, different archetypes, uh, structural models for uh, reinforced concrete structures and looked at different thresholds of damage uh, by uh, inputting the combination of main shock and aftershock time histories to, the, to evaluate the structural performance. And the authors consistently find that if the main shock the, if the first shock didn't produce a significant level of damage, then basically it doesn't matter too much. But if it introduces some level of damage, maybe a slight or moderate damage, uh, 
then the collapse performance is significantly uh, altered in these kinds of uh, post uh, uh, first shock uh, motions uh, in the structures. And essentially, these things need to be considered systematically into the future building code. And my next slide basically highlights that this, this kind of concept of sure. time-dependent hazard modeling into loss and risk has already been talked about. And essentially, this research highlights that there are ways to incorporate these hazard complex hazard calculations end to end to the risk calculation, provided you are making sure that both the fragility and the exposure are incorporated properly for risk calculations. In this particular study, uh, the authors haven't considered the damage dependent fragility, but there is definitely a possibility to enhance these results for further consideration. Yeah, thank you, Kishore. Let me let me just finish up very quickly here. So we can actually look at for any any collection of uh, earthquakes, an aftershock sequence or a sequence of earthquakes, we can make a composite shake map, which tells us at a particular location, in this case, a bridge, the number of times it's shaken over some particular level. And that can be used for this kind of damage degradation over time to, to start with a damaged structure rather than start with an intact structure. I'm going to skip over these last things and just get to um, some of the uh, important questions that I hope we can talk about. Uh, one is to follow up on Kishore's uh, point, and that is research is needed to define the post main shock behavior of structures. Um, we only know how uh, dam structures behave uh, with, with some limited models, and it's very difficult to get information about what happened during the first shaking and, and, and have that damage then da damage building also be damaged in a second subsequent event. So that's very unusual to have that very well documented. And as, um, as some have mentioned, current loss models like Pager, they, we do not call the inventory adjust the main shock losses for subsequent events. So correcting for damage, changing the inventory that's already damaged, already collapsed uh, from prior shaking is really challenging. And we don't know the inventories enough, nor how they behave, nor how well they were shaken um, to understand the changes in losses at this point. It's a great topic that we should be spending time on. In fact, the occupancy is a real challenge. People will obviously sleep out, they'll leave buildings, they'll um, be, be uh, red tag buildings they won't be occupying. So trying to predict losses from uh, aftershocks presents serious challenges. And then lastly, the, the handoff from time dependent hazard to time dependent risk depends on the quality and competence of the hazard model. And so I, the question to me is not whether we can do this. I think the models are there. The question is how well constrained are the hazard models? And, and we know from experience that the loss models are particularly uncertain. So we have to be um, concerned when we convolve that with an uncertain uh, probabilistic out of it. Uh, that's, that's time dependent. Thanks. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, David. Really important um, part that you covered. And I think we will save the questions to the end of the session. Um, so our uh, next speaker is um, Katsugoda, Dr. Katsugoda. Katsu is an associate professor and Canada research chair in multi-hazard risk assessment at Western University, Canada. His research is focused on catastrophic earthquake-related multi-hazard risk management from economic and societal viewpoints. His research interests are broad and multidisciplinary and cover a wide range of academic fields, including engineering seismology and earthquake engineering. So um, Katsu, take it away. Okay, uh, thank you for, very much for the uh, introduction. Um, I am going to be a bit away from a shake hazard and shake risk, uh, and then I'm going to touch on, um, I think, importantly important, uh, equally important uh, uh, topic, uh, which is related to tsunami, and uh, which is affected also by the uh, time-dependent hazard. So that is my uh, focus. So I would like to, um, because I'm Japanese and then the, um, I have witnessed some of uh, the damage uh, happened uh, after the 2011 Tohoku earthquake in Japan. Um, I'm going to start with this uh, picture. Um, this picture is taken, uh, I think, two days after uh, the earthquake. And you see the ocean. And then, um, so here's the ocean. And then the, the tsunami, massive tsunami, uh, attacked the coastal line. And then you see that the black kind of, uh, uh, you know, areas, those are all, uh, inundated areas. And then there were uh, fully developed uh, towns, uh, uh, communities around here, all washed away. 
So that's, uh, you can imagine that how powerful uh, this earthquake uh, and a tsunami could be. So uh, this 2000 Tohoku, uh, 11 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami caused um, uh, close to uh, 20,000 deaths, which is uh, very significant uh, for country like Japan, and then half trillion uh, economic loss, and then uh, still ongoing uh, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, power plant uh, crisis, which also costed at, at least another a half trillion dollars. And then this is my uh, the picture I took, um, how we look on the ground and it is really smells bad. And then the uh, it's just the, the massive destruction uh, happened. And then uh, this is the uh, damage survey uh, that has been done uh, by the, the government uh, after the event. So uh, you can see uh, it's color coded uh, um, uh, for the, uh, the severity of uh, damage. So the collapse happened uh, almost entirely uh, to the nearest community, which has about uh, two kilometer uh, distance uh, from the coast. So uh, in this community, about 50% of uh, 3,000 uh, buildings has been washed away completely. And then a lot of people uh, have uh, killed, been killed. So um, since then, I, I was actually the aspect engineer and then also the seismologist. But the after this event, I just kind of uh, transformed myself uh, to, to touch on um, the, uh, the tsunami. And then I have been applying the uh, so-called catastrophe risk modeling approach, which uh, Diego uh, introduced in the beginning of uh, this session. Um, so the risk is equal to hazard times exposure times vulnerability. And then I'm focusing on the uh, hazard part, but also I just want to uh, point out uh, Kish, uh, Kisher uh, and then the David uh, already uh, touched on uh, in the previous uh, presentation, but the, there's a lot of uh, important aspect uh, to transform hazard uh, into risk, uh, which requires exposure and in a vulnerability. So the transition of hazard to risk uh, usually is done through so-called fragility model. So this is the, uh, uh, the damage survey results. So this is actual damage survey results uh, of uh, 250,000 uh, buildings. And if we plot the, the, the extent of the damage as a function of um, uh, the inundation depths, the, how high the, the water was, then we see this kind of trend. So we can immediately see uh, that if the inundation uh, depths is higher, then um, the, the proportion of damage uh, becomes uh, severe and more severe. And if we turn this uh, graph 90 degrees, then uh, we see a uh, so, uh, standard uh, fragility uh, model, uh, which usually takes the, the tsunami hazard parameter on the x-axis and then the y-axis is the, the proportion of the damage. And then that's how we can uh, use and then develop uh, this um, uh, tsunami fragility curve, and which feeds into uh, this uh, uh, exposure and vulnerability component such that we can uh, 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 analyze uh, the losses. So the catastrophe risk modeling in the context of the uh, time dependent hazard uh, uh, I am applying uh, has, um, can be divided into two uh, major components. The first component is the aspect occurrence model, uh, which captures the renewal model and then the uh, in relation to the magnitude model. So those two, in fact, uh, I, I draw uh, with the uh, separate bubbles, but in fact, this uh, needs to be uh, dependent, interrelated. And then once we have a renewal model, time dependency model, and then a magnitude size model, uh, then we can generate a stochastic event curve. And on the other hand, uh, we can uh, simulate uh, the earthquake slip model, and then we can uh, perform um, the ground motion uh, simulation and also the tsunami simulation. And then combining that with the exposure and the vulnerability model, we can obtain the loss distribution. Once we have event catalog and then the loss distribution, we can come up with a time dependent multi hazard loss estimation. So that's the, the framework I, am, I have been applying uh, for my research. So, just to give a little bit more information about the, uh, the time dependent aspect, because this is the, the focus of uh, this uh, uh, COSEC uh, seminar. Uh, the renewal model I'm applying is the, the standard one. So the uh, interarrival time distribution uh, can be specified. It could be uh, log normal, it could be a BPT model or the Weibull model. And then the important aspect of this uh, renewal model in the, the risk 
and then of course hazard calculation is to treat the uh, the first event uh, separately, because the first event at, at the the present time uh, we already have observed that the no event uh, haven't happened uh, occurred uh, uh, since the last event. So we need to take that uh, information into account, and then we need to rescale and then shift uh, this distribution. And a subsequent event uh, can be uh, treated as a, a renewal model. And in this, uh, the renewal model needs to be coupled uh, with the, uh, the magnitude model. And then the uh, what uh, magnitude model uh, might be uh, applicable that depends on the, the specific region we are interested in. And in the seismicity, the, the uh, tectonics uh, influence uh, those kind of choices of uh, the magnitude model. So uh, in my uh, research, I use the, uh, the gutenberg richter standard model as well as the characteristic uh, model. But the those uh, has to be uh, seismic moment matched uh, such that the, the same amount of energy will be released. And then by combining this uh, renewal model and the magnitude model, we can come up with stochastic event catalog. Um, the, uh, the loss distribution part, uh, we can generate a range of um, the slip distribution. So the different magnitude ranges and then the slip distribution might change. Geometry of um, the slip uh, earthquake source model uh, could be changed. So there's a lot of uh, scaling law uh, available in the literature. So we can implement those uh, scaling law uh, to come up with this uh, stochastic source model. For each of the stochastic source model, uh, we run the, the ground motion models uh, with spatial correlation to simulate the seismic intensity uh, at the, the building location. And then we can also uh, solve uh, uh, shallow water uh, equation uh, to, to simulate uh, tsunami inundation. And then uh, we can uh, place um, the exposure model, so the building distribution and the cost model, those uh, uh, needs to be uh, specified. And then the, the fragility curve uh, for the shaking and then the tsunami uh, also needs to be specified. And then once we have hazard information from the footprint simulation, and in the fragility model, we can combine probabilistically uh, to obtain the loss distribution. So after this uh, probabilistic calculation, what we get uh, is the, the, as David uh, introduced, the exceedance probability curve in terms of uh, losses. And then for my case, I given uh, exposure model, exposure data set, um, I can come up with this, say, uh, the blue curve, uh, which is only for the shake loss or uh, tsunami loss. But also I can combine for each event, uh, I can combine uh, building by building um, the, the combined earthquake tsunami losses, and then I can sum them up to come up with this, the multi-hazard uh, uh, loss curve. So I'm gonna mainly talk about uh, this green curve uh, rather than the individual uh, earthquake and tsunami curves. And then um, for um, the risk management purposes, we can uh, define some sort of uh, critical uh, scenario. The critical scenario could be defined in a different way, but the uh, um, for my research, uh, I tend to uh, use the, the, the typical return period, uh, which I use uh, uh, for the risk management purposes. So such as the, the 100 year return period level, 500 year return period level, or um, the 1000 year return period level uh, in terms of total losses. So if I uh, take uh, three points uh, from the exceedance loss curves, then uh, the one particular scenario could be uh, extracted. Uh, that could be magnitude 8.2 or magnitude 8.8 .8 or 9.0, depending on uh, the probability level we look at. Given this source, uh, we can uh, pull out another shake map and also the tsunami inundation map. So this can be considered as a multi-hazard loss and a joint hazard maps. And then I found that this kind of uh, presentation might be useful uh, for risk uh, communication purposes because it shows that the what kind of earthquake scenario we are discussing, and then what kind of shake uh, damage could happen, and then also what kind of uh, the tsunami damage could happen uh, in one uh, figure. So now I am uh, going to uh, talk about the, the renewal, uh, the time dependent uh, model. And then the, I implemented the, the time dependent model as a part of my uh, occurrence model. And then the just as a kind of uh, illustration primer, um, the, the um, interval time distribution uh, can be specified uh, in a, the renewal model framework. 
And then the standard model would be exponential distribution, which corresponds to the uh, time dependent Poisson model, which is in blue. But we can also specify uh, the popular model, such as the, uh, the log normal, uh, Brownian motion uh, passage time, uh, BPT model, or the Weibull model. So those are shown uh, it, with the different colors, but the same uh, mean occurrence rate, which is the one uh, 100 year uh, return period level, uh, I mean, recurrent period. So um, you can see that the, the, depending on the which uh, distribution type uh, we adopt, um, we see that the very different uh, temporal uh, behavior uh, of the earthquake recurrence. And in this renewal model uh, would be, uh, is a flexible uh, in a sense that we can uh, uh, capture the different uh, degrees of confidence about the uh, this, um, uh, recurrence period. So if we are not that confident, then we might uh, assign the coefficient of variation, which is essentially the mean divided, uh, standard deviation divided by mean uh, as uh, the 0.5 or even larger value. And then we can also uh, take into account the uh, time elapsed since the last major event. So if it's zero uh, uh, starting, um, the, starting from the, the right after the, the major event happened, then the order distribution starts from uh, zero. But if uh, it is uh, in the middle, uh, some time already has passed, then we need to shift and then rescale uh, those uh, probability distribution. So uh, the linear model uh, is a flexible uh, enough uh, to, to take into account those important aspects uh, for the hazard and then risk modeling. So now I show uh, just brief uh, uh, example. Uh, uh, just illustrating the sensitivity of the, the uh, uh, time dependent model on the, the risk uh, calculation. So uh, this uh, figure uh, shows um, the exceedance probability curves for the combined earthquake and tsunami loss uh, for the, um, the Iwanuma uh, in Tohoku region, which I showed as a picture. And if we adopt the, the time dependent model, um, we obtain this blue curve. And then considering that the 10 years has passed, say uh, 2011, now 2022, so 10 years have passed, and then the, uh, the typical mean recurrence period uh, for the magnitude 8.3 and above uh, events is about 100 years uh, for Tohoku. So then uh, this is about 10% of the, the mean recurrence period has passed. Then uh, depending on the, the which models uh, to be adopted uh, or uh, underestimate or the, the produced at the lower uh, risk estimate compared to the time independent, time independent model, which is in blue. But if the, the time I mean, or recurrence is due, say 100 years has already passed, um, and then the mean recurrence period is 100 years, which is a somewhat similar situation for uh, Nankai, uh, Japan uh, uh, situation. Then uh, time dependent model, as you can expect, uh, would produce uh, the higher risk estimate. And then the order of um, this, uh, the risk estimate uh, is somewhat reversed. And then uh, it really depends on uh, which model uh, to be uh, chosen. Then uh, we can also do a similar kind of um, uh, sensitivity analysis, uh, just changing uh, by fixing uh, the probability distribution to Weibull distribution, but the, the change in the confidence about the uh, um, uh, how likely uh, those uh, probability uh, the recurrence would be. So this uh, confidence could be uh, represented by the different coefficient of variation, say 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7. So the larger value corresponds to flatter uh, distribution and then uh, become more and more closer to the time independent model, which is the Poisson distribution. So then uh, you can again see that the, for the cur current situation for the Tohoku, um, the, uh, the, the higher confidence uh, of uh, this, uh, the recurrence Period, recurrence process uh, would produce the much um, 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 lower uh, uh, risk estimate. But if the, the time is due, say 100 years already passed, then the, uh, the order of the, um, uh, the risk curve uh, would be reduced, uh, reversed. So uh, it's important to, uh, to consider a range of uh, the values. 
But um, in reality, it is not that easy, uh, in my opinion, to, to really to specify which parameter, which probability distribution uh, is correct one. So then uh, the practical approach uh, adopted in the PSHA and the PTHA uh, is to, to, to embed uh, those information uh, as in the uh, logic tree. So we can uh, consider a range of combination of uh, those models. So uh, here I considered uh, three different uh, time dependent distribution model, uh, three different coefficient of variation model, and then the three, two different uh, mountain model, which I didn't uh, discuss much today. Um, then uh, you can see that the, the logic tree uh, from the 18 different curves uh, could be uh, uh, obtained as a red, as a mean estimate. And then that can be compared against the uh, time independent model, which is in purple. And if the time is due, say 100 years already have passed uh, for the recurrence period of 100 years uh, process, then um, the, um, the risk estimate uh, would be much, much significant. Uh, so uh, in that uh, case, uh, we really need to-, to Four minutes. Yep. Uh, clear, uh, we need to consider a right range of um, uh, possibility as a part of this uh, logic tree approach. So uh, this is my last uh, slide. So just to um, um, uh, summarize the time dependent uh, hazard and risk model for uh, script tsunami hazard uh, are important, uh, especially for the long-term infrastructure risk management and then just uh, risk finances. So uh, insurance industry, the insurance industry, those are an important application. And then the, um, I didn't talk much about the, uh, the segmentation, but the other presenters uh, have pointed out that segmentation of the fourth plane uh, is an important aspect uh, that is also applicable for uh, the subduction aspect, uh, like Tohoku and Nankai. So there's uh, several uh, applicable model uh, in the literature um, that can consider the multi-segment rupture uh, in a time-independent way. And in all cases, I would emphasize that the uh, logic tree model uh, needs to be uh, taken into account. And then the aftershock uh, model can fit uh, nicely, uh, although I didn't uh, talk about this uh, into this uh, uh, time-dependent cap model uh, framework. And then last thing I think it might be important to point out uh, might be um, the time-dependent model. Uh, is really useful uh, when we want to expand the horizon of the risk modeling, such as to, to consider the climate risk, sea level rise. Yeah. So uh, in that kind of case, uh, integrated multi-hazard cascading and compounding risk framework uh, requires this uh, time-dependent model. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Katsu. Great presentation. Um, I guess we're gonna adapt the first session uh, uh, discipline a year and we'll jump to the last talk and then we will gather again to uh, put together um, the Q&A um, end of this session. So our last speaker today is Dr. Marlene Nist. She is a senior director at Risk Management Solutions where she has worked for over 16 years. She leads the earthquake source modeling team for RMS earthquake models. For the RMS North America Earthquake Models release, Marlene oversaw the hazard component development and its validation. Marlene? Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? All right. Um, um, my name is Marlene Nist. As I uh, was, was just introduced, I work uh, for Risk Management Solutions um, in the earthquake um, um, source group. Um, RMS um, has, um, has, has been working on development for, uh, of catastrophe risk models for the, uh, mostly for the insurance industry, um, but not only for the insurance industry. Um, and uh, to name a few models, we, we just, we have windstorm, flood, hurricanes, not just earthquake. <clears throat> um, for this talk, I would like to um, focus a little bit on the components of a risk model um, and um, just have one slide to just point that out, what, um, how we model um, the, the, what, you know, what the risk framework looks like. And then um, I think I'll, I'll just focus on um, mostly on examples of um, time-dependent impact on a risk metrics. So first I would like to um, 
outline a few um, standard risk metrics that have already been discussed in previous um, discussions. So I've been set up really well here. I don't need to spend too much time on it. Um, and then I would like to show uh, the influence of time dependence um, on average general loss and EP with a few examples, exceedance probability curve um, in San Francisco Bay Area and uh, for Istanbul, Turkey. Um, and then also focus on um, the comparison of the impact on risk by different time dependent models and how it really matters what time of time dependence you, um, you adopt. And to be discussed in this presentation, um, I, uh, I would like to point out that um, I will mostly talk about time dependent renewal models. Um, I call it, we call it short term, I think Matt would call it medium term um, and their implications for risk compared to the time independent long-term models. Um, we have some way of treating um, aftershocks um, and we definitely incorporate earthquake sequences. Um, but um, I will mostly be talking about these, these time dependent renewals apply to year to year multi year insurance contracts um, where the time dependence is modeled as a, as a probability default. So, back in our region, um, not real time or short term aftershock activity or earthquake forecasts, although that's definitely a challenge that we need to tackle um, in the next, uh, the next five years or so. So um, this is the, um, the earthquake risk modeling framework as I have it and like sort of simplified in my mind, where we have um, a stochastic event set or simulated event periods. That's what we are moving towards to. And I'll have a little bit of, of, of um, information about that towards the end, where we define a set of series, a set or a series of earthquake events uh, by uh, looking at their source geometry, their magnitude and their probability and their frequency. Um, and then um, we, um, if we look at the um, the impact on of an of an of an hazard model on an, an insurance portfolio, we calculate uh, the severity of shaking at each location in that portfolio due to the stochastic event set. And the severity of shaking is then um, adjusted by taking the geotechnical component uh, into account, with uh, which consists of the soil amplification, landslide, and liquefaction um, at that particular location in the portfolio. Um, and then what we call the vulnerability or the, the building response component, or um, where we look at um, the, the value of structures or life or infrastructure at a particular location. And we, we look at the mean damage due to that severity of shaking at the location. And then finally, in the risk quantification, we, we calculate the loss impact. So we actually we move into the financial um, part of the equation. Um, so this has come up a few times before. Um, exceedance probability curve is an important metric that we use all the time when we look at um, at, at risk. Um, it plots the probability of exceeding a particular loss level in a year. So on the on the x-axis we have loss, and then on the uh, y-axis we have annual probability of exceedance. I, it's not like the standard way. I expressed it in a percentage, but if you have zero percentage, there is no um, probability of exceeding that particular loss level in a year. And when you have 100%, obviously it, it's a, it's a um, high probability or it's, a, it's, for, it's certain that you will access that, um, prob that, uh, level, of, that level of loss. Um, and so to build an EP curve for an insurance portfolio, uh, we calculate the loss at each location for each event. And then we start building the curve by starting with the event with the highest loss moving off to the second highest loss, combining the, the probabilities, and then uh, moving all the way up to the, to the, to the lowest loss. And this is really uh, important um, parameter. Uh, no return period losses are important parameters for um, 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 solvency issues and uh, the management of portfolios, and, and oftentimes also tied into like certain insurance requirements. Uh, depends a little bit on the country or the region, but for instance, in Canada, um, there is a capacity requirement of a one in 500 year, year law. So if you want to do business in Canada, you have to make sure that you have um, that money in the bank. Um, and then average annual loss has come up uh, a few times already. I don't necessarily need to say too much about it, um, but that's basically if you look at a portfolio, you uh, you take um, um, the loss of event one and calculate it by its annual rate, 
and then you you sum all the events within your portfolio uh, to get the average annual loss on your portfolio. Um, in general, if you look at the um, exceeded probability curve, you can sort of um, say that the average general loss is the, the integral of the exceedance probability curve. And then what we usually use it for is to, uh, to, to, to determine the premium. So insurance premiums depend very much on the average general loss um, because there, it's in a way an, an identification of risk drivers. And in most regions, the, uh, the, the average general loss is mostly uh, controlled by the more the moderate magnitude, more frequent earthquakes. Um, that you can you know, just kind of sort of identify in this particular area of the, uh, of the EP curve. Um, this is the time um, independent um, contribution to average annual loss statewide uh, for California um, in the bar charts. And what we see is that, um, that the largest contributions are indeed coming from this uh, magnitude range um, between 6.5 and, and 8, more like. So now I would like to move over to a few examples of, um, of, of impact on a, uh, AAL and EP. Um, what we see is that, um, for instance, here, this is the same example of, um, of average general loss in California. Uh, in the front, we see the time independent dark blue bar charts. And in the back, we see the, uh, the light blue is the time dependent um, average annual loss contribution um, by magnitude bin in California. Um, for this, we adopted the, um, the, the, the BPT uh, time-dependent implementation um, by Field and others in 2015 that uh, Morgan highlighted. We did not adopt the EDAS component of, of that time-dependent component, so that is lacking. Um, but what we see in general, too, is that statewide approximately depends a little bit on, you know, what line of business you look at or, or, or what region, but in general, the time-dependent uh, average annual loss uh, compared to the time in the um, average annual loss statewide is about 10% higher. And what we see is that this, there's a shift um, in contribution to average annual loss from these 7.5 to 8 towards 6.5 to 7. And um, how that works can be um, sort of highlighted in this, this map on the right, where um, we see um, um, the in in uh, red, it's it, this is basically um, loss cost. So loss cost is normalized average annual loss um, for of time dependent um, compared to time independent. Um, and uh, dark orange shows regions where the time dependent component is higher than the time independent component. Um, light orange is where it's sort of similar, and then uh, like yellowish orange, very light orange is where the, the time-dependent component generates loss that is lower than time-independent. And so um, what you can actually see in the Bay Area is this, um, this shift from, um, from high or time dependence um, tied to the, the Hayward and the Calaveras fault system to um, lower time dependence tied to the 1900s or the San Andreas fault system uh, that just had a large magnitude event um, where it versus the, the Hayward and Calaveras fault uh, system having uh, like a high dependence like are considered to be due. And, uh, and so, you know, premiums are, uh, insurance premiums are set based on, on this high level of granularity. So it's, it's important to take it into account. Um, and then a completely different example is um, the time dependence on average general loss and an exceedance probability in, in Turkey, where um, the, uh, the North Anatolia fault zone is, uh, is considered to, um, to, well, it's 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 a, a strike slip fault zone in the northern part of Minot in Turkey. Um, it's a it's a kind of a classic example of um, of um, um, a series of events following each other in a short amount of time. And um, um, this was this is a paper from um, from uh, the US Geological Survey a while back. But then there's been you know more updates um, um, since then. But it sort of highlights really well. Um, sorry, highlights really well what's going on there. Um, and in general, I think this has been um, um, identified by lots of other um, 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 research 
projects as well, there's this gap under Istanbul where uh, the Northern Anatolian Fault Zone um, hasn't ruptured and um, where every, everywhere else it has ruptured. And so um, if we were to assume that that, um, well, so, and then, so yeah, on the left side, we see the exceedance probability curve for a countrywide portfolio in Turkey, but because the, um, the exposure in Istanbul is, uh, is really high and the, the risk is really high that you can basically say that um, even if you have a countrywide portfolio, your risk is controlled by what's happening in Istanbul. Um, and if we look at the exceedance probability uh, curve, where we have return period here and loss here, then um, we, we take a look at the events that are in the tail. These are megatrust earthquakes on uh, the Hellenic subduction zone and uh, very low probability, large magnitude background sources under Istanbul with um, return periods of, you know, in the thousands of years, so very unlikely. Then we have a series of events um, that are multifold ruptures on the North Anatolian fault zone. So rupturing more than, than just single segments, a fairly large magnitude events, but also fairly low probability. But then when we get into the, the return, the hundreds of return periods, we see that um, North Anatolian fault events with, within the Sea of Marmara seismic gap start to pay to, to pay, play a big role. That, that is this series of events. And um, in blue, what we see is the time independent uh, exceedance probability curve. And in red, we see the time dependent probability, uh, the exceedance probability curve, um, where we adopt like a very extreme form of, um, of time dependence with uh, where we say that the event can happen within the next few years. Uh, and then we see that, um, that first of all, the time dependent average annual loss can be uh, about 40% higher for um, just because Istanbul is such an important place. And, um, and the return period between 10 and 10 and 200, so significant increases. And, uh, and that turns out to be a really important factor because um, in order to, if you, are, you would like to do business in Europe, um, you have to have a reserve requirement of, of, a 200, uh, of the one in 200 year loss. And so what kind of time dependent uh, model you adopt for the North Antonio Fold Zone is very important. Um, and then Cascadia is a, is a is another example of uh, of where we should take into account we should take another look at what, how time different time dependent models impact risk there. Um, we have um, um, if you if you uh, for for a, a, a time dependent model just for the megathrust um, can be done in sev several ways. We um, if we look at the 10,000 year turbidite history that was um, presented and published um, extensively by Goldfinger in 2012 and af after that, a few more studies after that, that time as well, we, um, we see that the 10,000 year just average over, um, over a 10,000 year turbidite history that the megathrust event occurs is about 525 years. Uh, the time since last event is 322 years. That means that we are kind of a little bit over the middle of, um, of its recurrence. And if we model time dependence with this, um, a simple average recurrence, then it's not very um, impactful. We see that in terms of return period uh, loss, we have maybe a few percent. AL is a few percent higher if we model time dependence with a simple BBT average over 10,000 years. However, in that same uh, study by um, Chris Goldfinger, he also looked at the um, at the the possibility that um, we are um, that the the Cascadia subduction zone models um, ruptures in clusters, and and so what they concluded was that um, the probability that the Cascadia subduction zone is currently within a temporal clusters is significantly higher than the probability of it being in a gap, and so if we were to take uh, and if you look at this last cluster. Um, that um, has, an, has a, an average recurrence of about 330 years with um, um, recurrence intervals varying bet um, between 180 and 500 years. So that means that uh, the average Four recurrence, minutes. thank you, that, that means that the average recurrence is about, is about the same as uh, the time since, uh, since last event. And so if we were to incorporate that extreme version of uh, time dependence, then suddenly um, the, uh, the average annual loss goes up uh, by almost a factor of 10. And the 500 year return period loss um, is, is about three times higher than, uh, than the time independent or time de dependent, uh, more you know, 10,000 average model. And, um, and so that is important for, for Canada because as I mentioned, um, 
before, there is a 500 year um, return period of capacity requirement there. Um, I have a quick example. I hope I can um, um, discuss that quickly. There was, this was kind of a nice um, um, follow up on, on Katsu's presentation where um, we also looked at uh, different models for time dependence in New, in New Zealand, especially for the Wellington and Ohio fault. Um, and it was um, um, where we um, took into account the uh, inter-event time distribution of, um, of events on the Wellington fault to come up with a better model than just the BPT. And, um, oops, yep. What we did, did there is, um, is basically try to see if we can come up with a, a combination of BPT, log normal, and Weibull um, that fits that inter-event distribution um, better than just the BPT. And what we found was that, especially for the Wellington and the Horayu, for, for, for which the, the, the data um, are, are, you know, it's not like an enormous amount of data, but there is a, a good, good set of data, data available. Um, we found that um, that a weighted approach matches the data better. Um, that we find about uh, a thousand year recurrence on the on the Wellington fault and twenty three hundred on Ohario, which is uh, this is Ohario, this is Wellington. Um, and uh, whereas um, compared to the BPT, those numbers are very different, and so will definitely result in a very different risk pro profile for um, for the, the city of Wellington. Um, and here's my last slide where um, I. I'll, I'll focus on the opportunities. Um, don't necessarily need to, to discuss the challenges at this point. We can maybe talk about that later. Um, but um, I think one of one of our opportunities and most one of the more exciting things that uh, that we are working on these days is to come up with a better description of temporal behavior of earthquakes. We really are moving towards simulated event periods rather than just static event sets, but would allow for the implementation of more complex time-dependent behavior like clustering and, and damaging aftershocks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, great talk. We are jumping to the panel discussion for the second session and um, I'd like to hear from the panel. Um, there are some questions um, answered already. Uh, and I kind of want to revisit that. We could either use some of it for the general discussions, but I think there is one that is relevant to uh, buildings and might be an interesting one to, to cover. But uh, if I may, I want to just start with a question that I, um, sort of has been wondering this large earthquake in 99 in Turkey, 7.4 in August, then two months later um, triggered, quote unquote, which is a time dependent effect, another 7.2. Uh, it's a huge um, damage and loss. And by then we weren't quite talking about time dependent. Maybe, um, can you elaborate on that? Column stress was calculated. How did it address? Was it enough? What can we do for large earthquakes like this in places very vulnerable like Istanbul or other major cities? Yeah, no, um, definitely there, there've been, there, there are a, a few column stress models around. And, uh, you know, part of that high probability on the on the on the segment of the northern Italian revolt zone that is basically just south of Istanbul um, is is it's not just because it's a gap in the in the record it's also because of some of those Coulomb stress transfer models there's an interesting counter um, argument where um, there was an um, a large earthquake on the segment just west of uh, of the the the, the seismic gap and um, that ruptured in the early, early 20th century that uh, may have ruptured much farther towards the east. Um, and that would have taken some of the stress away again. So there's, there's, a, there's some debate about how long the rupture would be on the segment that hasn't ruptured yet uh, under Istanbul. But it's definitely a major concern. Yeah, thank you. Um, Torsten? <laughs> You know, true in which order here to go in terms of the questions. This one is for uh, Dr. Jajwal and Dr. Wald as to the hysteresis in in the build up structures, and I found that that very interesting. And 
you know, sort of thinking about uh, the degree of reversible versus permanent deformation, I wonder if you could clarify a bit as to 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 what extent do you have to be near the, sort of the design uh, specs of the building to have that hysteresis effect, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I would have expected you need to have sort of nearly collapsed it to move into the ductile plastic part, but that's probably not the case. And and how 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 far do you know? And 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 what are the design um, goals that engineers go for in terms of uh, you know uh, in terms of this sort of hysteresis? That's a, that's a great question. Let me attempt to give, shed some more light on that issue. Now, the examples that I provided uh, are essentially looking at code codified structures. They're essentially the structures which are built by engineers, designed by engineers uh, for a certain threshold of code criteria. And then the research community have taken those structures to evaluate uh, what happens in a situation where you can have a significant aftershock uh, creating an inelastic demand on the structure. Um, in essence, what researchers have found that a well-designed structure, if it has basically has not seen an even an yield acceleration demand on the structure, then it really doesn't make a significant alteration of behavior in a post, like a post main shock situation. Uh, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, including Professor Katsu here, I looked at this problem carefully in looking at the main shock combination of main shock and main shock or main shock aftershock sequences passing through a prototype structure and trying to understand to what level you're basically uh, fiddling that elastic phase of the structure and trying to reach into the inelastic phase. And once you go to, into inelastic phase, how much cycles the structures are going through in order to deteriorate the strength and stiffness significantly such that it introduces a, an alteration in the dynamic behavior of the structure, which could be anywhere from period elongation or uh, significant you know, lack of stiffness in the structure to go back to the previous stage. And that really depends upon the complexity of the second motion that you are exposing the structure to. This research is basically evolving and again, the, the conundrum here is that usually seismologists say that aftershock, a small event and you know expect smaller shaking, that's generally true from seismologist perspective and the ground motion records perspective, you never know where you are on the map, including the best of the ETAS models, you know, the, the way we forecast those points on the map for aftershock, any of those can produce a significant inelastic demand on a structure specifically structures which are not uh, ductile design, you know, and you have a large number of them in the rest of the world where, you know, you can you cannot expect a, a cyclic behavior and structures coming back to normal C. They simply don't have that capacity to come back. And those structures could be a significant, significant problem in terms of uh, the performance. I hope I can give some- Yeah, let me, let me add one thing, Thorsten, that, and that is that, uh, the engineered structures are typically elastic and they have this kind of behavior. The world uh, has, you know, buildings that collapse that are brittle and they typically do so at just based on the strongest shaking level. They can be precarious after they're damaged, but uh, brittle structures are the, are the real culprit around the world and not the, not the engineered structures. <clears throat> Just to follow up to that, um, I saw some studies using GPS in buildings um, for uh, for response or behavior. Long time ago, I don't know. If it's, it's, I know it's now buildings, especially important ones, heavily equipped for monitoring. But um, is GPS still being uh, used or um, relied on? I, I could tackle that. I mean, there's a lot of structural health monitoring to typically expensive high-rise structures. Uh, in a lot of them are in Japan. There's some in California. And they're typically accelerometer-based. Uh, and, and the, and the, um, the well-monitored structures have accelerometers and enough floors that you can look at the displacement between the floors, which is referred to as the interstory drift. And that's the most important measurement of the damage to a structure and potential for collapse. So you can do that with GPS. Um, on the, on the roof, but one of the 
tricks in Tokyo or other big cities is having GPS at, as a variety of floors to get the displacements at a variety of floor levels. And you can do that by double integrating the acceleration, but it's hard to get GPS in all places where you may have lots of shadows uh, in a domestic environment or in an urban environment. Okay, great. Um, Donna? Yes, thanks to all the speakers for your uh, excellent talks. Um, I have a very general question and that's, uh, I would be interested in your assessment of like, what's the largest source of uncertainty in these um, loss um, estimations? I mean, we heard this morning about um, advances in and challenges in, um, you know, understanding uh, time dependent earthquake behavior, but then, you know, adding in all the other factors that we've uh, heard about this afternoon. Um, I, I was just wondering where, where within that space you see is the largest uncertainty and, you know, how do we move forward in trying to uh, tackle those? Not it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think all of the above, but uh, researchers have looked at this problem carefully in the loss modeling perspective. And, and they generally tend to agree that the ground motion uncertainties are the biggest contributor to the fluctuation in the losses that we calculate uh, from any analysis. Having said that, uh, that problem in my mind is very well studied by seismologists, thanks to them, that we have a better handle on the uncertainty of the ground motion part. Um, the same level of vigor and uh, efforts still are not happening in the exposure and loss modeling world. And many of the loss modeling, uh, modeling professionals are, are basically working like Merlin, uh, you know, in the backside and it's definitely the research is happening in closed doors and not so much in the open uh, environment and again those things probably would change because of the societal demands but again that level of uh, interest definitely exists in terms of what those uncertainties mean in terms of the bottom line again the research by netfield and others highlight the issues and ask the pertinent questions uh, uh, about this this kind of modeling framework. And again, we need to do more before really we can answer such a question. Let me let me add add to that because it, it's um it's really vital. If you if you have a shake map and you know this shaking right next to your structure, you know at least the peak ground motions. And that will then reduce you know the probabilistic part of the problem. So having a good ground motion measurement uh, is really important. And you can use either the peak motion or the time series, which is even more useful for doing a, a structural analysis. It, and it really depends on whether your question is for one building or for the whole, you know, the loss for a given earthquake. And when you start looking at the single building, it's of course, how well you know the design of the building, how well you know the response to the building and how well you get, record the motion really close by. For a, for a whole city though, it's it's much more challenging because the ground motion has changed, but also you typically don't know the entire inventory. You don't know what the buildings are made of, how they're designed or or, or, um, or the more challenging things, which is where people are at the time of the earthquake for that structure. So those are really big limiting factors. All right, thanks all of you for indulging my very general question there. There is one question I wanna take before Jeff and Thorsten. Um, for Katsu, uh, how did you estimate losses offshore and what did it include? Um, I wasn't sure what the question is offshore means. Well, if, if the... Um, <laughs> The chat maybe will, um, if you could explain the question a little more at the chat. And uh, in the meantime, let's move to Jeff. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I have a question that was inspired by uh, Marlene's talk. Um, and as you were talking about the annu average annual loss, I can easily understand why that's a really important measure. But then my brain sort of wandered to, well, what's the worst annual loss? And that's probably not well defined, but how much dispersion, uh, how much can we actually quantify what the expected dispersion uh, in annual losses would be? Um, and, and is that something we can actually do uh, pretty accurately uh, when we look at 
you know, let's say actual annual losses uh, over time? Or is that something that still needs a lot of work to, uh, to, to get right? Um, so we, what we usually do is um, we normalize average annual loss. So we divide it by the, um, by, by, by the exposure. So, and then we can basically compare um, average annual loss globally. And, and so we have some understanding. Um, well, we have, you know, especially in the high, um, um, high exposure um, countries that have also um, a very uh, lively insurance industry, we have some understanding of what that average annual loss should be because you know, um, the insurance com companies tell us. And, and, mm -hmm. and so um, in countries like, you know, again, we, uh, you know, uh, Japan, um, it Italy, where uh, there's a lot of the, the earthquake insurance is, or the insurance industry has a deep penetration, as we say, um, the, uh, the, the numbers, and there's some countries in South and Central America, especially South America as well, we can actually really make sure that we match we match the average annual loss, and that's usually also while we are going through the development of model, that is our uh, basically the, the the sort of the metric that we use the most. To just make sure that we have it right. Um, then the exceedance probability curve can look can be you know it it's it's relatively easy to um, to but just because of the huge uncertainties. Uh, it's relatively easy to make sure that you're in the same, the, the right order of magnitude. For the uh, exceedance probability curve, it's a little bit more complicated in that sense. But we have a fairly good understanding. And also, it's also oftentimes it's fairly intuitive um, what your, you know, the average annual loss, the, the annualized average annual, the normalized average annual loss is, is called loss cost, um, what the loss cost values should, should look like uh, countrywide. Um, and um, yeah, we, 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 we and so we have a few a few benchmarks and then we we do a lot of um, uh, relative extrapolation you know of course mm -hmm. if, if you know that the loss cost in this country is this much this one should be higher so uh, yeah so we use that to to calibrate our models thanks okay thanks uh, actually going back to uh, Katsu, I think you're going to answer this question. Sure, um, I already answered in uh, the chat, uh, but the um, all the buildings are on the ground, on the ground, so nothing is on. I mean, you know, offshore. So, but like, if there is offshore, like say wind turbine or like some sort of oil rigs or some something like that, and if we have a fragility curve for that, then we can calculate the tidal and then also the um, the wind and then also um, the uh, and the tsunami losses, but then the potential, of course, shaking loss if there's a foundation uh, built uh, onto the, the seabed. So that, that's possible, but again, my calculation, all the calculation is done for uh, the, um, the houses. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I'll move on to Mark. Yeah, actually, I was gonna follow on that question a little bit myself. Um, so maybe I missed this, but for, for hazards like, you know, a mega thrust earthquake, which can generate a tsunami that can, you know, impact people thousands of kilometers away. If you think of the Sumatra event, right, there were deaths well away from the, the epicenter. I'm just wondering, do these models take into account that wide range of potential losses um, or are they really more focused locally? So for my calculation, uh, all done, uh, all calculations are done for the local uh, buildings. But the um, if we do the proper tsunami simulation, like uh, you know, the instead of Cartesian coordinates, we can do the spheric coordinates, and then say yeah, Tohoku earthquake happened, and then the wave uh, goes across Hawaii, hit ha Hawaii, and then the California. And for example, like some sort of important vessels, boats, uh, you know, harbored in the San Diego, for example. Then um, you know some sort of current uh, would you know happen in the in the port, and that might damage uh, those uh, boats. And then that kind of thing can be calculated. So there have been a lot of kind of development in research, and then also the application for the vessel uh, damage uh, fragility curve. So that's also an important aspect for the commercial perspective. Jessica. <laughs> 
Hi, so I have a the geologist question in this, which is how much does data collection matter or how important is it in terms of mapping faults on the ground, the paleo seismology record? There are some areas that we've seen today have these really, you know, amazing, you know, Southern California records, really great data sets, but other areas seem like there's a big data gap um, in that. And how important is it um, to be doing that kind of base level data collection or is that essentially within, assumed to be within error in the models or kind of accounted for some other way in the models? So I was gonna, but when we were talking about large sources of uncertainty that would, would have been, you know, fairly close up for me. Like we don't know where the faults are, not everywhere. And uh, you can, you know, if you assume that you know exactly where the, where the if you know, if you assume that you, where the faults are, you know where the faults are, then, um, then, then you have to basically, you know, calculate everything else. And of course, there's uncertainty in all the other components. If you don't know where the faults are, you're missing a fault. That's a huge source of uncertainty. And so, yeah, um, it's really important to know where the, where the faults are. And the, California is, is, is in relatively good shape. Um, but for instance, countries like, um, well, I mean, there's lots of, there's still, still a lot to be done on, on in terms of where the cost of faults are, yeah. So. Thank you. Well, I think uh, now it's time to move on to the general session. I'd like to thank everybody's speakers. A great session. And um, we'll, we can carry on and, and sort of answer some of the Q&A um, or uh, maybe the audience or panel members. Jeff, to you. Yeah, thanks. So our, um, the speakers from the first session should be joining the panel here um, momentarily um, and uh, along with those from the second session. So uh, we'll have uh, all of our speakers here. And um, what I wanted to start out with was actually a, sort of a little bit of a different kind of question. We have, uh, people here on the panel from uh, private companies, from a private a foundation, from government agencies and uh, academic institutions. And I'd like to, to throw out sort of the question about, about career opportunities and career paths. We've got uh, uh, more than a hundred people uh, online uh, here who have been uh, watching uh, these presentations and some of them are early career scientists or students. And so uh, I'd like to, to just hear, um, uh, particularly from those from the outside of the normal academic, or at least the, the academic environment or present academic environment, um, what, what are some of the career opportunities and paths that uh, young scientists interested in uh, applications of, of this kind of analysis uh, might be able to take? So maybe I'll, I'll throw this out to Marlene first and, uh, and then uh, maybe Richard and Marco or, or David and Kishore, uh, but I think uh, others can, can raise your hand and pipe up here. Yeah, um, so we, there's a, we have a large group of, uh, of model developers um, within RMS in the California and in the London office um, working on earthquake or um, or you know any any other type of natural catastrophe on the science and on the engineering side so we um, we have um, opportunities I won't say a lot because these it's not like we have hundreds and hundreds of people we have you know like dozens of people um, on, on on the model development side but it's it's very um, so we have like in my team we have um, people with the geology a seismology um, um, geophysics background, uh, and then there's this uh, the the engineering side that has a has a large group of um, of people with uh, um, masters and PhD degrees, usually uh, from various technical universities. Um, I think, unfortunately, this year we don't have an intern internship uh, program, but it varies from year to year, and so there's always. I, I always tell everyone just you know contact me at the beginning of the calendar year, and then we can see where it goes. Unfortunately, this year it's not going anywhere. Hopefully, next year we'll we'll get that back up, um, and then we usually have a couple of people over the summer as interns. Um, but there there are um, 
uh, definitely opportunities uh, within model development that you, where you would start as a as a um, like a junior modeler, um, mostly um, learning about the trade because it's it's not necessarily something that you would know before you join. Uh, but then uh, there, it's it's I I think it's a the job itself is a nice combination of of um, learning new things, applying what you know, and uh, and 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 really trying to be on the forefront of science and 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 publishing. So um, hopefully. Um, we'll have a few opportunities this year, um, but I usually post the jobs on uh, on various um, earth sciences like uh, SSA and uh, and SCEC uh, channels. So you should pop up there. Yeah, thanks. And I think if any of our other speakers have things to add, also just about what kind of preparation uh, people would uh, would uh, want to to have to 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 follow up these kinds of opportunities. So yeah. just raise your hand if you're on our our group here, and then. And then thanks. And then I'll go also to our, our, our panelists here uh, in the room. Uh, yeah, so Morgan, I think you raised your hand. Um, yeah, at the US Jess where I work in Pasadena, we have um, usually have student interns, paid internships in the summer where we bring in undergraduates. You can look for announcements on USA Jobs in the February, March timeframe. And then for uh, graduate students who are graduating, we have Mendenhall postdoctoral opportunities that are advertised in the fall. So that's our primary way of bringing in new researchers into the USGS is usually as Mendenhall postdocs. And then the other just thing I want to mention is, I mean, you can enter from lots of different fields. I came in from physics, you can come in from you know, the earth sciences, engineering, geology, lots of different areas you can come into this uh, you know, seismic hazard analysis from, but just take statistics. Whether <laughs> you're an undergrad or a graduate student, please take statistics. It's extremely important for almost any or science related field. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, uh, Jessica, I think you. Um, yeah, thanks, Jeff. So Jeff just asked us um, a little bit, and we just got a bit of an answer, but I'm going to push on this a bit more that, you know, as somebody teaching in an, a science department, apart from statistics, what is it that, that you want to see? Um, what other training do you want to see from kind of the earth science, the geophysics realm um, for people looking to go into this? Any, you know, any additional insight would, would be appreciated. Um, I would say programming. Um, uh, so um, on a variety of levels, both. Um, so at, at GEM, we produce, you know, in addition to producing seismic hazard and risk models, um, we write software to do all the computations. And um, then there's a huge amount of uh, data analysis tasks and, um, you know, prototyping. And so being familiar with, with a variety of numerical programming uh, techniques, we pretty much just stick with Python. So, so, you know, you don't need to be able to code up like huge thing, you know, finite element models in Fortran or something like that. But being able to have um, uh, a sort of diversity of, of programming skills from, you know, basic data analysis type stuff, being able to, um, uh, you know, do statistical programming as well as um, if you can contribute to um, the larger models and code bases that we have and, and having some facility with, you know, with writing functions and writing tests and, you know, um, making nice software rather than just having like a mess of scripts, you know, sitting in a folder and stuff like that. Um, that's really helpful and, and something that's, I think, pretty outside of what um, what most people are getting in a, in a geoscience education. Um, uh, the people who come with, in with it um, are generally self-taught and there's big gaps, which is gonna be, you know, with a, a field like PSHA, there's gonna always be gaps in people's educations. But... Jessica. Let me go to, uh, to oh, oh, sorry. Okay. I was gonna go to Marco uh, next. Sure, and then sure. David. Marco and then David. Yes, so in addition to what Richard was saying, I think it's very important to have knowledge of that analysis because we deal with a variety of, of information. And so it's very important to be able to handle that and most of all work with that in a quantitative sense. Um, um, of course, uh, uh, it's in, since seismic hazard and seismic risk are interdisciplinary, it's important to have a good background in one area, but also have a knowledge 
of, of other disciplines. So if you are a geologist or a geophysicist, a little bit of knowledge of the components that are more on the engineering side is important and vice versa. That's very important because uh, as we, we also learned uh, during the seminar that we had today, it's very it's, it's, uh, essential to work together to make sure that the engineers are working with the seismologists, the seismologists are working with the geologists because that's the only way in which we can improve what we are currently doing. So that's, uh, and so the students uh, has to be aware that uh, they need to be able to communicate with people with different profiles uh, and be interested in learning many other things apart from the ones that have been learning during their uh, regular curricula. That's my, and, and be interested in, in learning new things. Uh, there is always time to learn in, uh, new things. Uh, I, I personally think that I have still a lot to learn and I enjoy learning. So that's the type of approach they should have. Thanks, let's go to David next. Yeah, I, Jessica, your question, I, and, and to follow up on Marco, I think the multidisciplinary part is really key. I, I'm a geophysicist by training, but what we're looking for, and we've got some pretty exciting problems to work on, is filling these gaps in these, these uh, areas that we identified as the limiting factors. And I would say, you know, on a, on a data set side of things, there's all sorts of geospatial skills and mapping some of the newest technologies. We have like building footprints for the entire planet now, but we don't know what's in them. <laughs> and we, we could actually use machine learning AI approaches to try to assign those structures based on what we know uh, in different countries in terms of the inventories. So geospatial to engineering analysis that, that's necessary to understand those structures. But then um, a lot of the time, and Matt Gersenberger got on this uh, quite a bit, is communicating what we're doing in terms of losses, uncertainty, and and very difficult, uh, you know, post earthquake environment where we're, we're estimating the fatalities, we need to communicate these, and so we need people that are trained with the science, but also have a sensitivity to what the user needs are to try to best uh, get these out in a useful form. And then, uh, just lastly, we're really excited about um, expanding the importance of our products in the post earthquake environment to follow up later in time and be more useful for downstream decision making. And so we're going to be trying to take in ground truth information, INSAR data, all sorts of observations that are typically not used in our initial model development to try to update those in a, in a recursive way uh, as a function of time. But the expectations are that these things get better and they get more precise. And so uh, people that can cross these disciplines are going to be really fundamental. Mm -hmm. Great. So let me go to uh, Donna next. Great. Um, I had a question that uh, actually follows up on what uh, Jessica was asking at the end of the um, last section, and that's on the kind of opportunities and challenges of including more constraints on um, from paleo seismology in time dependent earthquake models. It's one of our most key constraints that addresses the um, shortcomings of the um, characteristic earthquake model and is a constraint that can help us with the uh, multi fault rupture. Uh, um, scenarios that um, that Morgan was describing. And so I was just curious on your uh, thoughts on that. Um, the paleo seismic data, yeah, it does help if we have enough of it. It's very difficult with only three or four events <laughs> for not to put any constraint uh, with the long-term rate of those large events is, especially if we don't know how big they are. So that doesn't have a strong effect on the model as there are lots and lots of events. Um, certainly the geologic slip rates that are collected, they always say those have a stronger effect just on the, the final, that, that's just like how often the total is, you know, the total, the whole moment budget of the earthquake is, goes into that. So that's super influential. And then the next level of influential, I would say, would just be like the connectivity, not necessarily for faults that are well connected because it doesn't necessarily, hazards and sun dependent on like exactly which earthquake it is because we don't know anyway, but for a fault that is otherwise very isolated and would have no way to rupture with another fault unless there was a connector that could be discovered, that would be very important because it would actually change the maximum magnitude of the rupture. So unfortunately, <laughs> unless you have a lot of events, it just doesn't impact the model that well, the paleo seismic events. Okay, um, Richard, you had a follow-up? Yeah, I would say that um, uh, it, in my perspective, so the main thing that I do is build fault source models for well, all over the world. Um, uh, the paleo seismology and, and neotectonic slip rates, geomorphic rates are incredibly valuable. Um, 
And you're not going to, with, with one or two paleo seismic events, you know, like Morgan said, you're not going to be able to really super well resolve questions of, you know, like what kind of recurrence distribution do we want to use and things like that. But for so much of the world, um, uh, virtually no, you know, you know, one or 5% of the faults have even been investigated. And so, and when people investigate them, obviously they like to go to the fastest structures. These are the, you know, the important ones for understanding regional geodynamics and stuff. But um, what, you know, what you find is that you'll have, you'll have an area that it's got, you know, seven faults and then, and every, you know, there's 27 studies from one of the faults and no one has touched the others. And if you're really trying to understand the geodynamics, that might be fine, you know, what really happens is that there's a big argument. And so, you know, so you want to write the paper that resolves the big argument, but like from a hazard perspective, that resolving that argument is great. Getting a better rate is great, but, you know, not ignoring the vast, um, uh, you know, sea of very obvious but unstudied structures is really important for helping us really understand what's going on in the system. There are also things like um, understanding in the past what kind of multi-fault ruptures have occurred and um, so looking at splay faults, you know, trenching on splay faults and trenching on, um, you know, potential connectors, mapping of, of kind of distributed deformation zones in between uh, principal faults, um, I think is really important for, for being able to beat down that uncertainties in areas that are poorly studied. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So let's go to uh, Ringan. Thanks. Um, I guess maybe this is follow on to Marco and um, uh, Marco's uh, comment about data. So I guess when we talk about education or maybe having a young generation uh, learning this and learning statistics, programming, using the tool, you're using geospatial analysis, those are great, but I think the main um, backbone of the whole work is 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 data like uh, seismic data. Uh, what are the um, accuracy levels of seismic data that gets into PSHA, either time dependent or independent? Um, what are the location issues? Where the catalog was collected from? What are the magnitude relationships that are contributing to the end results? Uh, those are kind of in the educational level, maybe something to also go in parallel and not just learning the code itself, but really important how the logic trees are kind of put together and um, the, the data is captured correctly. The current recurrence intervals, the completeness. Um, uh, I know it's kind of more generic to, to most of you here, but uh, people who are learning how to do this, this is very crucial. Um, I think to, to kind of bring on. Thanks. Uh, Morgan. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that comment that I, I agree. And I think this is, even beyond like general statistical knowledge, just the way to think like a scientist in a way that we even, like the easiest person to fool is yourself. And just like, not just learning like the basics of hypothesis testing, here's how you do a p-value and all of that, but how to run a research program or to study a new phenomenon where you don't know the answer in a way that's like being faithful to like, yeah, not just the uncertainties of the problem, but am I even thinking about it right? Am I, yeah, basically, am, am, am I not fooling myself and like trying to come up with a good story for like this exciting research problem we're trying to do? Am I actually being totally honest about what I know and what I don't know? I think it's something we start learning as students and we're all still working on it, right? Because, mm -hmm. um, Science is hard, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a it's a great point. It reminds me of a of a, a fine Richard Feynman quote that that the easiest person to fool is yourself. So you know, once you stop fooling yourself, then you know that's 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 the the first step to to learning anything. Um, let's see. Let's go to uh, Torsten next. Uh, I guess a question for all panelists, but um, perhaps inspired by, by Matt's um, uh, description of the government response as to mitigation in an impressively, um, you know, uh, an impressively uh, effective way, perhaps. But also, um, you know, Katsu and uh, Godasan's um, illustration where for his study region, he showed that 
the uh, taken tsunami has it into account really shifted the the loss curves dramatically and, and i suppose for for this particular setting right, we have a flat plane with pretty good building codes so there it was sort of fairly straightforward to say well some tsunami wall would have sort of theoretically helped but i wonder in terms of going from those explorations to having national and international um uh, sort of uh, return on investment considerations for mitigation. Where where do we are, right? Uh, uh, where do we are in terms of using um, physics or statistics based models in terms of saying where do where is the best bang for the buck in terms of reducing loss of life and loss of infrastructure? Mm -hmm. I would say that at the global scale, there's still a lot to do. Because uh, uh, when you start to, um, to enter into these arguments, uh, you, you immediately filter out 90% uh, uh, of the countries uh, that you have in the world, unfortunately. Um, very few countries in the world at the moment have a national seismic risk model, for example, and not just a seismic hazard model. And for taking decisions like the ones that you were mentioning is essential to uh, think in terms of risk, not in terms of hazard, unfortunately. And most of all, uh, even for the hazard, many, many components that maybe you think are important when you calculate the hazard, they get uh, irrelevant or less relevant when you move, when you shift from the hazard to the risk. And so, and since the risk is emphasizing, uh, um, let's say, the application or is closer to application, um, having a strong link between the hazard and the risk is essential. And I don't think that we are yet there, for at least from my experience. There are many efforts. There are uh, certainly countries that are trying to move forward in that direction, but uh, there's still a long path, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I'd like to go back to a question that was, uh, it was put in the Q&A or the, the specific question was about US-Canada uh, cross-border and that was answered in the Q&A so people might be able to see that. But I wanted to ask the question a little more broadly. Um, when we look at, at estimates that come even of, well, certainly of time dependent, but even time independent um, estimates um, done for different regions or different countries, um, how well do those estimates blend uh, at the borders um, or not? <laughs> Marco, Marco should answer that. <laughs> um, well, uh, it varies a lot, of course, uh, because, uh, uh, because uh, um, uh, clearly every country is taking, uh, is taking uh, um, different strategies in modeling the hazard, uh, different decisions uh, in, uh, in accounting for the epistemic uncertainties. Uh, and that uh, clearly has an impact on, on the pattern of the shaking, expected shaking that then uh, you, you calculate. But if you look at, in general, the, the global hazard map that uh, is indeed uh, the result of the combination of 31 uh, models and the corresponding maps, uh, and uh, it's true that there are differences, but the overall pattern, I would say that is uh, um, relatively uh, consistent between the different uh, models. Uh, clearly, there is a lot uh, to do uh, to, to improve. For example, something that uh, we've been discussing uh, years ago when still was possible to travel without many problems. Uh, um, so during a meeting that was involving uh, um, representatives from the USGS, uh, GNS Science uh, Japan, was, for example, to develop benchmarks uh, for testing the ways in which we are building components of another model, because that could help in um, homogenizing and trying to standardize uh, at least uh, the, the fundamental methodologies that we are using for building other models. And that would go in the direction clearly of having models that are more and more homogeneous. Okay. But uh, uh, um, as you said at the moment, uh, unfortunately we still have uh, uh, differences. Uh, and, uh, 
and not just in terms of the model, but also in terms of the information that is used to build the model. Because clearly, okay. uh, go on, sorry. Yeah, that's great. No, I'll just add that uh, Marco just covered the hazard topic. Uh, when you think about loss and risk, those differences are even larger when you think about how the, the way buildings are designed historically, as well as the way they are built, you know, depending upon the country's history and the construction and design practice, those differences are even larger when you get to the loss and risk side. Okay, thanks. I, next, let me ask a question that came from the audience, another one. Uh, so this comes from Gerald Bodden at NASA. And uh, he says that NASA will be producing a PS INSAR uh, deformation map of North America. Uh, the goal is to do all of North America um, through um, using Sentinel-1 and NISAR data. Uh, so this can be combined with uh, GNSS data from uh, EarthScope Network of the Americas and will provide very detailed spa geodetic spatial and temporal changes in the land surface. So uh, David had mentioned that INSAR data can be included in his approach, but in general, how can these sorts of data sets best be used to support and be integrated into earthquake risk assessment? So a comprehensive just, screen map. Yeah, let me just clarify that, that the use that we were talking about is for post-event um, situational awareness with change detection. And that's, that's the different beast. So I'll let someone else answer that. I've been working um, with Tim Wright uh, at, um, at Leeds on incorporating mm -hmm. um, INSAR into, um, and they produce, I think, similar to the, the PS INSAR um, strain fields that would be uh, discussed here, uh, very high resolution, broad scale deformation maps that I've been using to um, uh, incorporate into uh, geodetic geologic geodetic block models in order to get fault slip rates. And then from the fault slip rates, then you have to go to, um, uh, you know, then you make hazard models and then, you know, and that gets transferred to risk. So there's, you know, it's, that's, that's at the very beginning of, of the, the sausage making process. Um, but I think it's, it's still pretty valuable um, uh, as long as you have, have a way of incorporating geodesy into um, understanding of, of earthquake rates. Um, I've been using block models because I can, I, you know, cover a lot of ground and still have pretty high accuracy where the faults are. Um, there are, you know, one could, one could also use the methods um, like that Peter Bird's been working on where you take a strain, a strain map and then assume every pixel is a seismic source. But um, it gets really difficult with those in order to properly account for, um, uh, strain localization on geologic faults and you know and particularly when we get into all the things that like Morgan was talking about where you have multi-fault ruptures and um, but you really want the slip rates on the faults to guide where you see those um, those ruptures versus just having you know a raster where like you have a big earthquake in this cell you know and maybe not in that one and so um, so there needs to be some sort of framework in order to incorporate the geodesy into a fault-based model um, really understanding off-fault deformation through NSAR would be awesome, um, uh, you know, when combined with the fault model. Yeah, thanks. And Morgan mentioned earlier the importance of the moment budget uh, and, and so on. So in places that don't have as much, let's say, you know, ground-based data, uh, if we had a very thorough strain map, how, how, how much does that improve our ability to... Uh, to actually make a, a, an accurate assessment? Uh, dramatically. So, um, so for example, since, since apparently all of North America is being covered, I've been working on um, models for both uh, Canada and Mexico. Um, well, and, and going through the whole US and the US part is, is covered pretty well. But um, once you get north of the Canadian US border, you know, the density of ge geodesy coverage really drops dramatically. And there's, some pretty big arguments on over whether there are even active faults in the BC mainland and um, other than up in the McKinsey's. And, um, you know, and so INSAR in, in places like the, the interior, the Fraser River Valley, Thompson area of the British of British Columbia would dramatically increase our um, uh, ability to, to decide whether we even want to consider 
these giant Mesozoic strike slip faults that run through there as potential earthquake sources. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm gonna do uh, one more question from the Q&A here, but I'm gonna generalize it a little bit. Um, is PSHA already old? Is this the framework moving forward? Or do we have to look for a different framework at some point to, um, to, uh, to better uh, bring in uh, the sort of time dependent uh, problems or, or, or is it more a matter of tweaking and refining uh, and adding some enhancements to what we already have? Uh, Morgan first. Um, yeah, I think I, I mean, after going through the user process, yeah, I, I do wonder if there is a better way if it's not something like simulators, for sure, just be, just given to include everything we know has made this, <laughs> what started out as a simple model, blossom into, you know, something, you know, <laughs> extremely complicated to put in, like, all the multi-fault ruptures that we need. We needed hundreds of thousands of ruptures. And then we had an underdetermined inverse, inverse problem that we had to regularize in order to get, you know, some sort of sensible solutions out of because there's no way to constrain the rates of hundreds of thousands of ruptures. We get things that are like, we can't individually constrain rupture rates, but we can get magnitude distributions that are somewhat stable, at least with this method. But there's all this physics we're leading out that we're just having to add more and more like um, statistical rules to like force it in there. And so, yeah, I am interested to see if perhaps one day simulators could take over this role. If they didn't have so many um, free parameters, if there's a way we could like actually <laughs> extract something sensible from them that we didn't force, um, then I would be very excited about it. Uh, Dave. Yeah, uh, Diego knows I always look for the elephant in the room. And, and there is a, there's another beast here that we're not touching and that is earthquake physics. So if you have exact, if you told me the exact history of the faults in, in California, I wouldn't know about the next earthquake because uh, rupture dynamics can control the outcome. And you, you know, we've got places where earthquakes rupture into places that have no stress. And we've got places that are stressed that don't rupture when they have, you know, like Parkfield had these enormous high stress drop events right in the preparation zone. And it was, we know it was ready to go and didn't, didn't rupture. Um, so we have a, a very big challenge in the time dependent component that, that um, requires bringing rupture physics into the into the equation, even adding a whole set of new variables to Morgan's <laughs> already growing list. But right. if those physics based, like, if we could somehow have a, a physics based simulator that, you know, I mean, ours we seem to get some of it, but like actually produce all of the statistical laws that we're putting in by hand now, but they just came out emergent from the physics based simulator, and that would be great because <laughs> we would actually have less hand tuning to get a sensible result which is my goal would be like less tuning, less yeah, forcing, forcing the models to do these things that we know it should match. Ideally, we would put in what we know and it would already, and because we had put in the physics, it would match all of the scaling laws that we know and the behavior Great. that we see. Thanks, I'll go to uh, Marco and then Diego, and then I'm gonna have uh, Jessica ask sort of our last new question. So, uh, so Marco. So to go back to the question of, uh, of PSHA and if PSHA is dead, uh, I, I don't think it's dead, actually. Uh, it depends probably the way in which we think about PSHA. But if uh, I intend PSHA as a framework to integrate uh, uh, various information. And so in, in that sense, uh, I think that uh, uh, everything we've been discussing right now can enter into the construction of more advanced models for performing PSHA analysis. Uh, in my opinion, what you were saying, Morgan, for example, so the output of, of a simulator, I see it uh, exactly as the output of a, of, a, of a simulation or a stochastic event set that can be integrated also in a PSHA framework as well. Thanks, Diego. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I, I guess what I take away from, from this meeting is that, yeah, the time dependence is hard, but there's good reasons to be hopeful that progress is being made. But I wanna ask a related question to this we were just discussing, and it's something that Kishore, you said when we met before this workshop uh, for all the speakers to organize themselves. And it was that the engineers don't want the hazard to change with time because then you have to change the building code with time. And there's other applications where changing hazard with time might be difficult like Oklahoma. Sure, you made a one-year hazard map, which is now expired, 
Um, so how do you deal, but it can come back at some uh, time in the future. So how do downstream applications, how do we expect them to deal with this time dependence? Well, there is a sector that definitely has a lot of appetite uh, for time dependence, uh, and it's the sector that is represented by Arlene. So all their insurance and reinsurance sector uh, is definitely very, very interested in, in having time dependent models. Uh, so Gem, we work with a variety of, of uh, communities uh, and definitely the one that is working on, on in the insurance sector is the one that is asking more and more about time dependent models. Uh, far more than the engineering sector. Uh, for the critical facilities, as we were trying to explain, uh, uh, time dependence is not that relevant because you look at periods of time in which uh, uh, time dependence is kind of kind of fading. Uh, but in the insurance sector where, uh, where they look for uh, um, renewals of, of the policies that is uh, in the order of one year or a few years, uh, time dependence is essential. Yeah, just... that. Sorry, that's also why um, you no, know, the, the moving to and I agree with with Morgan about that moving into a more simulated uh, setting is is really important because that is as far as we can tell right now is like the the main um, solution to 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 you know to the problem of incorporating time dependence appropriately, and uh, but I agree it's it's. Um, it's not necessarily the level of, of shaking, it's about it's bet when when that level of shaking is gonna start. Okay, Kishore, I think you were about to say something. Yeah, I would just say that I think, yes, insurance sector is very much interested in this problem, Marco, but I think over the long history of this earthquake problem, as we all have learned, uh, looking at earthquakes, looking at damage, um, I think we have broadly told the community or the consumer of our research that, you know, this PSHA helps you to design buildings for future. Uh, you think about earthquakes as, you know, this kind of beast which will produce strong shaking, it, will, it can bring buildings down, things like that. But since the time dependent has evolved, the thinking has evolved over the last 10, 15 years, predominantly, I would say, based on the Canterbury earthquake sequence, which really surprised a lot of people and professionals in the community about the impact of, you know, this main shock and aftershock and how it could influence the, the downstream users of these products. Uh, what I would say is that collectively, we need to educate people now back again in terms of earthquakes don't know this dependent and independent thing. They just happen. It's just a hazard you just need to deal with. And you need to basically communicate to the users. I'm, when I'm saying users, I also include general public. You know, there is a large effort that goes on when big earthquake happens. People try to communicate this four shocks and then they call it, you know, main shock and then aftershock, like Morgan was suggesting. It's pretty confusing to common people, like what exactly it means, uh, you know? And if you think about like engineering community also, engineers have believed and relied on seismologists and geophysicists to give us the best science available on how to think about earthquakes and shaking so engineers can design their buildings. But this, this, this education need to basically have to happen at an accelerated pace if we really need to think about this time dependent issue in a more holistic sense. Okay, so uh, we do have a number of other questions in the Q&A. We're unfortunately not gonna be able to get to all of them, but uh, one uh, sort of final question topic. Uh, so I'll, I'll turn this over to Jessica. Thanks, Jeff. So I, I had a question for everyone and, and um, particularly Mark, Mark and Richard, which is funding sources for this type of work. You know, I understand that some of this is coming from um, insurance and, and other, users of these products, but in thinking about how we generate science that is open source and accessible to many people to use, what are the other sources to fund this, this type of work? Um, and if, if you guys can comment on, on how you see this, this moving forward from that perspective. Um, so I, I think, I think that there, the open source component of it is 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 really important, and 
Um, the biggest way to lower costs um, is to to simply make things public and um, and you know and not only and both both that means public data um, as well as public software and not something that maybe you know the source is available but you're not allowed to modify it but um, uh, you know but but having both software licenses and data licenses as well as practices that allow people to collaborate and allow people to to share and, and um, build on um, on what's out there. So both OpenSHA that um, the USGS uses for California and um, as well as their new software that's um, and their previous software for the rest of the US, um, those are those are all open source and they're very you know easy to build on. Um, software that Gem builds is is also open source and, and we have tons of users all over the world. Um, who are able to collaborate and and and, um, and work on things uh, much more cheaply than they would otherwise, I think, and able to you know to add two things so so that everyone receives the benefits of of uh, the work that individuals put in. Um, in in terms of funding sources for um, pure research, and um, I I don't know, you know that that's still just very you know government and institutionally driven. GEM is supported, it's a public-private con, uh, consortium where we have some, uh, we have a lot of mostly government sponsors, different governments um, throughout the world and um, as well as private sponsors, um, such as you know, almost all of the other panelists are, are you know, involved with GEM in some way. Um, but, but, you know, there's, um, it can be very difficult um, for GEM to work with um, groups in the U.S. Uh, National Science Foundation hasn't been interested in providing us with um, with funds because uh, Gem's based in Italy, and um, so so sort of those sort of institutional um, uh, barriers on the research side or funding barriers on the research side that deal with you know who's receiving funds and what country can can inhibit um, international multidisciplinary research. So I, but I don't know what other like pots of money may be available that we can tap into. <laughs> other thoughts from our speakers? All right, well, we're, we're almost to the very end of our time. We've had the, the, the final uh, item on the agenda. I'll pass this on to uh, Torsten, who uh, is, he got the job of, of summarizing our afternoon in four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> We've um, heard a remarkable, uh, beautiful and diverse set of topics as to the time dependence of seismic hazard. And I'd like to thank all the participants, all the speakers for their contributions. It's clear that some of the questions that are still challenging us are old ones. What is the degree of uh, the validity of the seismic cycle. Um, how do faults link up? What do we do with the faults we don't know about? But what's new, I, I think, is that we're seeing the insights from those longstanding questions really to make their way into our probabilistic descriptions of hazard and recognizing that the time dependence is a universal problem. And there is really no, no steady state on any of the time scales considered. And one fault might be characteristic uh, in one time and might be clustered in another. And, and it's certainly not your grandma's seismic hazard assessment. And it's clear that the, the problem is a, is, a, is a global one that goes across boundaries really in every sense of, of the word. And it's clear that it cannot just be purely uh, statistical or purely physical in terms of the modeling. And it's clear that it cannot be a national effort. It has to be a global one, an international one. And it's clear that it cannot just be a geophysical one, geological one. We've heard uh, you know, from implications from rock mechanics and to financial products. And, and we need to address this issue with, uh, with global ramifications um, uh, from uh, in, a, in a collaborative approach, you know, crossing academia to NGOs, to, to the private sector, to the, the government. And, and I think the, the opportunities are, are clear in terms of um, bridging these traditional boundaries. Uh, 
it's not just a seismic hazard assessment versus mitigations. Those two are, are clearly linked. And they're, they're, they're real opportunities in that time dependence because the system is coupled and the physical models that we use to improve the statistical description have to work across time scales. And so understanding the present day state of a fault zone in terms of its implications for hazard requires understanding the physics of how fault works and those physics have to be the same in the long-term evolution. So there are real opportunities to, to make headway here and there are opportunities in terms of um, solid earth contributing here in terms of enhancing the, the training for students so that they, uh, they make for uh, better contributions in the future, enhancing not just the understanding of statistics, but also of, 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 of programming, of data analysis and, and building those models that are able to factor in the amazing new constraints that we have to get at the state, such as from geodetic observations uh, on the verticals, on the horizontals, and to make headway on the integration. And so I, I think those are exciting times and um, the um, challenges are clear and some of the answers will hopefully lead to a better understanding of hazard um, for the global community. So I'd like to thank all the speakers again and all the contributions. Uh, the material from this session will be available on the National Academy's website. And um, uh, that's it for today. So thanks everybody. <laughs>